Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Once again, I'm Montgomery County Council President Gabor Burnos, and we will now resume our council session. And we move on to item number 16, which is the semi-annual report, which we look forward to every year uh, from the Maryland National Capital Parking Planning Commission. This year, colleagues, we will hear all the presentations and then reserve our questions after all the presentations are complete. That way, everybody doesn't get, nobody gets shortchanged uh, because we uh, want to make sure we hear from everyone. I want to welcome Chairman Anderson. Thank you so much for your continued leadership, sir. Um, I'd like for you to introduce your team and then uh, turn it over to you. Now, Ms. Dunn, uh, just to give us some, uh, uh, just a quick overview. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here in person. Um, the big news, I think, this time around is uh, we have a new commissioner, Carol Rubin. Thanks very much for sending uh, Carol to us. She's done a, a fantastic job. Um, I thought perhaps you might want to turn to all the planning board members at the conclusion of the presentations by the Parks Department and the Planning Department, if that's acceptable to, you, to all of you. Absolutely. Um, I do have a, just three slides I want to show, but Pam, did you want to go ahead? Good afternoon, everyone. I think you turned off the mic by accident. No. It's still on. Mm -hmm. Oh, there. Sorry. <laughs> Learning. Haven't been here for two years. Um, <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, yes, you are having uh, your semi annual report from the Parks and Planning Department this afternoon. You typically get this twice a year. You get it in the fall, which is just an update of where they are in the work program and things that are going on in the planning department, any updates. And you also receive this in the spring, which is the one you're receiving today. This is usually done in anticipation of reviewing the operating budget. Um, so keep that in mind as you're listening. Um, at the end of the planning presentation, they usually will present to you a chart of their um, recommendations for their upcoming work program items. This again will be a topic of conversation as we go through the operating budget. So it's an overview of it today, but we typically cover it with committee and then with council as we go through the budget. Um, so with that, I don't want to waste any more of their time. They have a lot of great stuff to show you. So that's, thank you. I just have a, a, few a, few, a few news items I wanted to share. The first is uh, the slide that you're seeing right now shows the results of the, of the vaccine mandate that we uh, opposed, like, imposed. Uh, we started uh, in the fall, but we're not able to implement it fully until uh, December 1st for uh, legal reasons related to uh, negotiating with our unions. Uh, I think you'll see the results were that we have achieved almost 100% vaccination rate across both the Parks Department and the Planning Department. We're showing you Montgomery Parks there because I think this reflects, uh, you know, the larger um, represented workforce, the unrepresented workforce, and uh, shows you the, com the uh, comparison and what the results of the mandate were. Uh, most of our employees voluntarily got vaccinated even before we announced that we intended to require it, and that's reflected in uh, the fact that we were over 50% uh, even before we started. But as you'll see, until we made it mandatory and we're able uh, to enforce that, we were not going to get up to that 95 to 100 percent level that we've achieved today. So we're uh, proud of the fact that we were able to implement that with minimal disruption to our work, so, work workforce or program. We had a handful of resignations and disciplinary cases, but almost everybody ultimately uh, complied. So I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, second slide, if we could see that. Um, the other uh, news item I'm really excited to, to bring to you is that uh, we've been working for a couple of years to deal with our HR and legal issues around uh, being able to be more flexible about hiring people who have past criminal convictions. We think that it is essential to be able to hire people with uh, criminal histories uh, that are in the rearview mirror. They've uh, completed their term of incarceration or uh, parole or probation, and they're trying to be reintegrated in society. And uh, I think that this is important for two reasons. Obviously, we all know about the school to prison pipeline and the uh, socioeconomic and racial equity implications of the inability to get a job after somebody has been uh, through the criminal justice system. Um, if you can't get a job mowing the grass or maintaining 
uh, working on a maintenance crew in the Parks Department, it's hard to imagine how you could be reintegrated. We have excellent jobs with pensions, health care, other benefits, good salaries, and we think that that's our uh, ability to hire uh, people with these kind of uh, histories is very important on a case-by-case -case basis, but we wanted to eliminate the categorical exclusion of huge numbers of people who couldn't be hired by either uh, department in, in, in the agency. And the second reason we think this is important is because obviously like almost every other employer, we're struggling with uh, filling vacancies. We've had a lot of turnover as a result of the pandemic, and we think that opening up the hiring pool is going to help us uh, to continue to maintain the parks, to keep everything uh, going, and there may even be planning department uh, staff positions that may uh, be opened up as a result of this to candidates who would otherwise have been uh, excluded. So this is really just the first step. We want to work with the state and with um, other with organizations that try to help reintegrate people um, who are in search of employment after they've uh, had a, a criminal conviction, and we look forward to reporting on the results of that um, in the near future. Uh, next slide. Uh, the last thing I want to just tease a little bit here, we're not going to give you a full presentation, but uh, we're doing a number of equity projects, including a redlining and segregation uh, mapping project, a uh, lot of analysis of equity in both uh, departments. But this one, I think, is really interesting because we were able to, our research staff was able to look at every census tract in the country and analyze what's happening in terms of the uh, economic demographics of the neighborhood, as well as the racial and ethnic demographics. And it, what we've shown in this chart, it calls out uh, four census tracts in Montgomery County that are that stand out for, for uh, various reasons. We're doing a master plan in Fairlands Bix Cheney, and what this table shows is that the number of higher and middle income people has gone down over the last 20 years pretty substantially. The share of, and as well, and the share of lower income people as well as the absolute number of lower income people is going up. We could characterize that as concentration of low income, it's concentration of poverty. Uh, the Lake Forest Mall track stands out even more strongly as an area with more concentration of lower uh, income people and uh, more affluent people leaving. Surprisingly, one of the neighborhoods that you might characterize as exhibiting uh, um, uh, metrics that you would associate with displacement is Poolsville, not one of the urban areas, not one of the central business districts near transit, which is sort of the stereotypical place where displacement occurs, but the rural western uh, part of the county. And downtown Silver Spring, contrary to popular belief, has seen an increase in the uh, high and middle income population, but also an increase in the lower income population. And that's at a come at a time when there's been thousands of new housing units, market rate, as well as uh, MPDUs and other affordable housing happen uh, uh, going on. So I think that what you see, what you see from this, I hope, is that these assumptions about where gentrification of displacement occurs, what's going on in the different neighborhoods within the county, are are really in some ways in defiance of the stereotypes of how this works. And I'll. Um, not spoil the punchline for later when we get into this in more detail, and I think you will, I hope you'll be as interested in this as, as I am, I think you're going to see that the places with the most market rate housing construction have been the places with that have not experienced displacement. To the contrary, there have been more higher income, middle income, and lower income people who had the opportunity to live in the neighborhoods where there have been the most market rate as well as affordable housing built uh, over, over time. And I think that that's something that we'll all want to consider as we're working on various uh, master plans and, and land use issues and how that relates to racial and socioeconomic uh, equity. Um, I, last thing is an advertisement for the uh, doorstop we left on your uh, chairs, which is the pedestrian uh, master plan existing conditions report. Just a little light reading for you. I think we are going, when this plan is done over the next year or so, just like the bike plan has won all sorts of awards for being state of the practice in its area, the pedestrian plan is the follow-up to that. I'm sure it's going to be just as exciting and have just as much impact on your budgetary discussions and really making uh, Montgomery County a walkable uh, place in, in every way. And uh, with that, uh, and, and I just want to say our functional planning staff has just been fantastic and already done a ton of work as is reflected in that huge 
tome that you're all sitting on now. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Mike to talk a little bit more about what's going on with the Parks Department. Good afternoon, County Council. It's great to be with you in person. For the first time in over two years, I was thrilled to find out that my badge still got me into the garage in the building, so thank you for not cutting me off. My introductory uh, photo here should uh, tell you where we are, two iconic historic symbols, the Canada Dry sign, and it's a little bit dark, but in the upper right, the acorn. This is uh, Acorn Urban Park and the uh, close section of Newell Street. As you know, we've been doing uh, every year increasing our park activation program of new and interesting and exciting events that bring people together in uh, social settings, uh, focusing on urban parks. This particular event was called Acoustics and Ale, so we had music, food trucks, beer vendors, and I was pleased to walk in on a winter night at about uh, 8 o'clock myself and see the place packed, everybody having a great time. And uh, the final tally was a little over 400 attendees. And one point I want to make is, as we experiment with the increased allowance of alcohol in the parks and events like this, we are not experiencing issues and problems. People are generally behaving responsibly and having a good time. Next. This is, uh, I've talked to you in past semi-annuals about my increased focus on managing our vast park system by utilization of data. This is something that our data analytics team and human resources uh, people have come up with in the last year that helps me gauge uh, the diversity within the staffing of the Department of Parks. I can chop up reports by work location, by grade, by job title, and it uh, allows me to understand, particularly within the organization's areas where I should focus on increasing diversity. And while we have a uh, relatively high number of vacancies right now, which is a challenge in getting the work done, it presents a great opportunity for the diversification of the workforce. And this is a great tool that allows me to uh, know where to focus. This is our uh, park recreation and open space plan. We do it every five years uh, to update the long range vision for the park. We're uh, almost all the way through it. We've had a tremendous public outreach phase with uh, surveys, uh, both written surveys and intercept surveys, a lot of online work. Uh, we got great response with this graph tells you as people were answering the questions, factors that make their community a great place to live. And you'll see parks, trails, and recreation up there in third place sandwiched between uh, public schools and the uh, absence of traffic congestion. So that made us feel very good about uh, validating what we've heard all during the pandemic is that people's valuation of the parks and open space uh, in our county has grown. And it also is validating the fact that our focus on active urban and social spaces has been uh, the right direction. Park acquisitions, real quick, these are five big acquisitions we've made in the recent past. Uh, four of them are in urban areas, urban parks, which we've said has been our focus. We were really uh, you know, focusing on uh, growth centers and population centers. Uh, we are thrilled, though, that uh, we just acquired a conservation uh, a park out in uh, Broad Run, and we preserved over uh, 400 acres of high-quality forest. And that is simply evidence that while we're focused on uh, active urban and social, we certainly have not turned our back in any way on the Parks Department's uh, mission in conservation. And on the development side of our capital project, I won't touch on all these uh, parks, but the point I want to make is we have remained busy during the pandemic. We did not let us slow down our delivery of uh, the capital program. I'll just note three I'm very excited about. You'll all be invited or maybe have been invited to a ribbon cutting at Edith Rockmorton Park in Kengar. I believe it'll be in May. We're very excited working with County DGS to be opening Gene Lynch uh, Urban Park in downtown Silver Spring this summer at some point. That'll be a wonderful event. And then lastly, I'll just note a, a big uh, local park out in White Oak at Hillendale. We just got that under construction. It'll be about a $6 million project, and we'll be thrilled to deliver a better uh, community park out in White Oak uh, probably within a year. So this nomenclature is still relatively new to us. We didn't have park refreshers three or four years ago. It's all about doing meaningful improvements to our community parks at a lower cost and a faster Time frame. I just wanted to let you know it was in the queue. Uh, you see these uh, parks listed here. The refreshers tend to be in the two, two to three million dollar range. The mini refreshers may be under a million dollars, but still very uh, meaningful improvements. The asterisk next to those 
certain parks indicate uh, parks that are either within or adjacent to equity focus areas. So you can see that we are allowing that tool to influence uh, uh, quite a bit of the direction of where our capital program is going. And then grants and special funding, uh, we have been very, very aggressive seeking both state and federal funding. There's gonna be a lot of uh, thank yous to be giving out soon. It's a little bit premature because the dust hasn't settled in Annapolis, but we have got uh, very positive news on several grants. Uh, we do expect to get uh, about $2.7 million for what we're calling our Long Branch Initiative, which is to improve uh, about eight parks in the Long Branch area to improve the uh, amenity value of those parks for the community, about a million dollars for South Germantown, and then another two and a half million dollars for an adventure sports complex in Wheaton Regional Park, which we're extremely excited about. And those are the big dollar projects, but there's many, many others we expect to come through. And by the time we talk to you in May, about the operating budget, we'll have a complete list for you of all the great things that our state delegation and our federal, our congressmen have come up with, and, and uh, we'll all be spreading a lot of thank yous around, I hope. Uh, this program is not new. We started it last year, but I'm pleased we have a program enhancement that we're going to be able to fit within our budget to expand this program. We call Roots to Rocks. The goal of this program is to reduce participation barriers for people of color by bringing a brand new bike fleet and instructors to multiple events throughout the year, and by building a high school trail volunteer program and a leadership uh, development program. So graduates from the high school leadership development program will receive a free mountain bike and helmet, and our goal is to have six events this year. We've already had two with over 100 participants in each one. Fields, I could talk to you all day about fields. It really is a passion for us. Uh, this is Oakview Elementary School. You see a nice note from the principal in the before and after pictures. Uh, I just want to con continuous remind, remind you we're about 95% of the way cycling through the elementary schools. There's still a handful out there that we have never touched that are not in good condition. And uh, thanks to the Fed Committee, you've supported uh, $600,000 per year on the CIP to uh, work through those remaining schools, but it never ends because once we finish those and have them all in our maintenance program, we will have to go back and then renovate some of the high use older fields that we haven't really given a complete renovation to in 20 years. I've mentioned East uh, Silver Spring as a, a potential example of one of those uh, properties that is due for again is, and the, the other point I wanna make is that obviously since we started this program, uh, our technology, our machinery, our knowledge, the cultivars of cultivars of Bermuda grass, uh, things like that, we can do miracles now compared to what we could do 20 years ago when we renovate a field. So we need to continue this program and definitely and cycle through. Another one I won't say much about, Kent Mill Elementary in an equity focus area. You can see the quality of the turf when we're done. Next, please. Uh, we're pleased that we won uh, Wheaton Regional Park Field 2, won uh, Field of the Year from the Mid-Atlantic Sports Turf uh, Management Association. The project included uh, turf improvement, new uh, warning track, uh, upgraded infield, and then ADA improvements to make sure everybody can get to the field. This one, for those of you who played baseball, you know that the field can be 99% ready, but if there's big puddles around the batter's boxes where the batters have dug holes with their cleats and it forms a mud puddle, it can ruin the whole experience, or you might have to have the kids spend their first half hour with rakes and uh, turfus trying to remedy the situations. And this is the type of work that our team routinely does. Uh, this was a winter renovation at two very high use fields in Capitol View uh, Homewood in the Kensington area. And then through our maintenance practices, we do everything in our power to keep the field looking like that throughout the season. And then the last field I wanted to touch on is White Oak, which we've talked to you about before, but this really tells a story. This is uh, the newest form of uh, Bermuda grass that's called iron cutter and uh, it normally would not green up till June but you can see from the uh, field surface where we had the growth blankets on it over the winter that harnessed the sun's uh, rays, heated the soil. We opened that field April 1st with, uh, with green Bermuda grass and you can see around the edges where we didn't have the growth, growth blanket what it would look like if we had not uh, used that and uh, it's just an example of what it takes labor, it takes materials, but this is technology and things that we were not doing five, 10 years ago that are very effective. Um, Untold Stories is a budget, uh, another program enhancement. I'm pleased we're gonna be able to fit within our budget allocation. 
uh, Untold Stories is a goal to develop interpretation of underrepresented groups in the county's history, aligning with the national trend to address inequities in representation of public facilities and bringing visibility and inclusiveness to our parks in a very timely way. Our parks have numerous uh, very rich, powerful stories of African American, Asian American, Hispanic and Latino, Native American stories that have yet to be told uh, and interpreted. Um, you've been a lot of discussion about Johnson's Park and Emory Grove with the uh, church meetings and the Negro League baseball field that was the first uh, lit field in our system. And that's just one example of many of the type of stories that we feel need to be supported and told. Just a couple more slides, special events and programs. I'll just cycle through what these are uh, clockwise from the upper left, the Maydale Community Celebration to open up our net zero uh, newest nature center in Maydale, uh, the uh, Shirley Povich unveiling of uh, the uh, uh, monuments to uh, Shirley Povich and big train Walter Johnson that our old friend Bruce Adams of the big train uh, really championed. Uh, upper upper right, we had an urban, our first urban wood sale. We netted twenty thousand dollars selling uh, wood that our uh, our tree crew milled. Uh, various types of uh, very valuable wood to woodworkers. Woodworkers. Then on the bottom, you have the MLK uh, week of service cleanups. We removed uh, eight thousand pounds of trash in the parks with uh, over two hundred fifty volunteers. The bottom middle is the Acoustic Sinale. It's event at Germantown about a month ago in the winter that also attracted three to 400 people. And then the lower right is called Craft and Sip, uh, which is just another type of example of activities that we haven't done in the past. And then as I said, our activation program is ramping up. I'll just let you see the names of the various programs. One I'm very excited about highlighted on the right is Comedy Series which will be new to us. These events are all outlined through September on our website. We promote them heavily through social media. And again, it's all about getting people uh, active and socializing in our parks. We want our parks full of people. Enterprise, I'll just say here that uh, like any uh, business fund, it suffered with revenue losses during the pandemic, but I'm very proud of the way our staff managed it. They really have a, a business mindset. Well, revenues were down, they limited expenses, and the fund is coming out very healthy with a healthy fund balance that will be able to renew older enterprise facilities like the ice rinks or build a new uh, enterprise facilities in the future. And again, this is all with zero tax supported subsidy. And uh, I'm very proud of our division chief, Christy Turnbull. She inserted herself right in the uh, meetings during the pandemic with the health officer, with all the other nonprofits and restaurants and business owners that were trying to keep their, uh, do whatever they could do to keep revenue up. And she did a great job making sure we did what we could safely. And then finally, budget. We, I don't, we talked to you fairly late this year on the operating budget. It won't, I think, be until May, but it is a prettier picture than past years. Uh, we are underfunded in the executive's uh, budget by $1.7 million, what we asked for in the parks. We can cover most of that, but we are going to ask for you to uh, help us out with uh, just about 250000 on the reconciliation list for items involving athletic fields, park infrastructure, and uh, hard surface uh, trails. And I thank you for your time. And I think I'm going to turn it over to Gwen Wright and then come back for any Q&A you might have. Thanks. Um, great to be here in person and to see you all. I will uh, note that we have um, our two deputy planning directors, Robert Cronenberg and Tanya Stern, who are with us. Uh, a lot of our uh, division chiefs, including a new division chief I'd like to introduce, who is uh, Vince Hugh in the back, who is with us. Uh, in our IT division. He worked for many years in county government with uh, HHS in IT, but uh, he then moved away and we lured him back to, uh, to work with us in the planning department. Um, the first image that you see, of course, is the Marriott uh, headquarters and hotel. I know many of you have probably visited the new hotel. It's exactly the kind of really class A type of facility that uh, we've wanted to have in uh, Montgomery County, both for uh, people who are visiting the county, but just those of us who want to go to out uh, to uh, a restaurant or a great rooftop bar. 
Uh, next image, please. Um, since 2013, and I, I am picking that date because that's when I came back as planning director, uh, we have worked really, really hard to do the best urban, suburban, and rural plans around the county. We've approved and adopted, uh, we have 22 approved and adopted plans over that nine years. We have five plans in progress, and that does not include three countywide plans, our bicycle master plan, our pedestrian master plan, our update to the master plan of uh, highways, and Thrive Montgomery, of course, which is still underway. Um, and you can see from this map, we really have planned uh, a lot of the county, a lot of the sort of key growth areas of the county. Next, um, this again is just highlighting all of the plans and projects we have going. We're so thrilled that you all voted out corridor forward, the I-270 transit plan just this morning. Uh, we've been working very productively with the Fed Committee on the Silver Spring downtown and adjacent communities plan. Uh, you've had uh, work sessions on the Potomac Overlook Historic District, and staff is busy working on plans to bring to you uh, in the next year or so in Farrell and Briggs Cheney, Tacoma Park, the pedestrian master plan, which you all got a lovely uh, a hard copy of our existing conditions report. Uh, Rustic Roads, our Wheaton downtown study that we're very excited about, the Great Seneca plan, which is sort of phase two of uh, the update of the Great Seneca Science Corridor plan. We, you had approved the first phase and we talked about needing to do a second. And as was mentioned by Chair Anderson, uh, previously we're doing a very, very innovative project on equity focus areas and community equity index and we'll be um, talking about the neighborhood change research that he mentioned at the beginning of uh, the presentation. Uh, in fiscal year 22, at the very end of this fiscal year, we're going to be getting, be beginning some plans that you approved last budget season uh, for a University Boulevard corridor, Clarksburg, Silver Spring Communities Plan, and our uh, segregation mapping project. Um, you'll be hearing in our budget proposals for uh, new in fiscal year 23, we'll be holding another of our Makeover Montgomery conferences that we do with the University of Maryland National Center for Smart Growth. This will be the fifth one that we will do and it will be in September. Uh, we'll be um, undertaking a whole range of placemaking events, particularly in the up county. Uh, we have done some placemaking events um, in um, uh, sort of the uh, White Flint area and also in uh, Burtonsville, but we hope to do events in uh, Damascus, Germantown, and um, a couple of other places up county. And uh, we're going to be working on a Friendship Heights urban design study. It is not a sector plan update, but it is a study so that we can work collaboratively with our colleagues in the DC Office of Planning who are looking at the DC portion of Friendship Heights and ideas for how to sort of reinvigorate those areas. So that's something we're working uh, collaboratively with DC Office of Planning. Next. One of the things I want to uh, emphasize, and I have to say, you know, Mike and Parks, it's a hard act to follow because they're doing so much uh, in terms of equity, but we've also been very involved with an equity agenda for planning. Um, not only is it one of our main outcomes for Thrive, but we're doing um, a lot of individual projects in historic preservation. I think many of you know about some of our renaming efforts, uh, both for individual streets and communities, as well as the Josiah Henson Parkway renaming. Um, we are undertaking research on Asian American Pacific Islander heritage uh, in conjunction with the State Historic Preservation Office. We're looking at LGBTQ plus heritage sites also in conjunction with the State Historic Preservation Office. We've been very fortunate to get grants from the state for both of those last projects that I've mentioned. 
and um, even projects like the Potomac Overlook Historic District that you have recently be, been considering. We've really noted uh, the accomplishments of the people who lived in Potomac Overlook, people who were um, women who moved uh, a lot of great uh, things forward, uh, Asian Americans who moved a lot of great things forward. We're definitely integrating those thoughts into all of our preservation work. Um, we're also moving forward with our um, neighborhood change analysis, which again is what Casey talked about at the beginning, and that is tied in with our equity uh, opportunity index work. We're um, working on our Vision Zero efforts, and that's been something we've had a great collaborative effort with the County Department of Transportation uh, on how we can reach Vision Zero goals. Uh, we've been very engaged with um, innovative outreach that has a real equity lens. I think some of you have heard about our efforts in Farallon, Briggs, Janey, and Tacoma Park to do um, work with a group called Everyday Canvassing to actually do door-to-door -door, um, interaction with residents and uh, really uh, meet people where they are, which at this point is in their homes. <laughs> Um, and uh, we are definitely looking forward to having a lot of additional interaction through our placemaking efforts. As things have loosened up from a uh, COVID standpoint, we've been getting out and doing a lot more uh, in-person events at, um, at, uh, at sites throughout the community. The final thing I want to just mention is that, you know, we also are looking inward. Our, our department takes uh, the whole issue of equity very seriously. And one of the things I wanted to share with you is we've actually, um, in addition to doing uh, intensive staff training on um, racial equity and social justice issues, putting uh, that um, as a uh, factor in every single staff person's performance evaluation, uh, both that they get training and that they show um, their, uh, their equity lens in all of the work that they do. That is a performance factor for all jobs. Uh, we actually have also created an equity peer review group, which is a group of um, internal staff from all different divisions within the planning department, and they meet on a monthly basis to review all work products that the planning department is producing to offer ideas and suggestions as to whether we could look at things more from an equity um, perspective. Uh, and I'm really excited about that. I think it's a great model that other, um, other groups might want, to, uh, might want to consider. Now I'd like to switch gears briefly to regulatory review. We are unbelievably busy. And I just want to explain our, depart our uh, planning department is divided into three geographic areas, down county, mid county, up county. In down county, I've asked for folks to provide some statistics just since July 1st of 2021. Since July 1st of 2021 in down county, we've approved 977,000 square feet of uh, new projects. Of that, 152,000 are non-residential, 850,000 approximately are residential. We are averaging 15.6% MPDUs for all of those residential projects. And the average review time for a site plan is 126 days. Next image. These are some of the kinds of projects that are resulting. Uh, I included the one at the right, which is an older project because it was one of the winners of our 2021 Design Excellence Awards, the Darcy and the Flats in Bethesda. Next. In Mid-County, the numbers are actually extraordinary. And I think it's because we've had a lot of interest in um, biohealth, uh, and a lot of that has been in Mid-County. In, again, since July 1st, we have reviewed and approved 8.1 million square feet of new development. 1.28 million is 
non-residential, uh, about 6 million residential. We're getting on average 14.8% MPDUs. Again, I hope you all note that these numbers on MPDUs are well over the 125 minimum, which is what the, um, the law requires. And the average review time for these has been 138 days. Next, you can see some of the outcomes. Um, you know, again, I, I, I chuckle with the staff. We just approved, a, I think it's about a 200,000 square foot addition to add the Adventist Healthcare Shady Grove Medical Center. No one mentions, no one even knows it, notices it. In other communities that uh, I've worked in, a 200,000 square foot addition to your hospital would be like big news. They'd be singing it from the rooftops. Here, it's just another project. Move on to the next one, um, which is pretty amazing. The, the ones uh, on the top are some of our biotech projects. Uh, the one uh, at the lower right is a new building that is also going to be, we have two new buildings in Pike and Rose. This is the one that's um, focused on biotech. We have another new office building going up right along Rockville Pike that I think you all may have seen under construction. Uh, next. Up County uh, is also extremely busy. Since July 1st, 27 development projects, 1.2 million of um, non-residential and over 2 million of residential with 19.6% MPDUs. And the average review time is 156 days. Next image. You can see how upcoming, how up County is coming into its own. The projects on the right are uh, single family detached, but the, the projects you see on the left are non-residential, uh, in particular the lower left Milestone Innovation Center is a very large uh, speculative uh, biohealth project in the Germantown area. Uh, next. We have our chart, which is almost unreadable, <laughs> but I can tell you what it uh, basically says is that we are keeping, uh, keeping course. We are uh, doing the plans that we've mentioned um, in the previous slide, such as Fairland Bridge Cheney and Tacoma Park and pedestrian plan and rustic roads. The, the primary new item, work program item that we're adding for fiscal year 23 is the Friendship Heights uh, Urban Design Study. Uh, but we do have three projects that are starting at the very tail end, meaning in June, uh, which would be the Clarksburg Master Plan, the University Boulevard Corridor Plan, and the Silver Spring Communities Plan. So those most of the work on those will actually happen in fiscal year 23 but they are also part of our work program from fiscal year 22. Uh, and with that, I will close just to thank you all uh, for your continued support. We are, um, we are unbelievably busy. We stayed busy over the course of the pandemic and now it's even busier, so thank you. Thank you both. Um, Chairman Anderson, I'll have you introduce your Colleagues, thank you. Uh, well, at the uh, at the end, we have, as you know, Jerry Sitchi. Jerry is uh, right there in the mix every single week, and uh, particularly interested in transportation, but contributing across the board. Jerry, did you want to say anything? Uh, yeah, just at the mic. Yeah, comment a little bit on the Josiah Henson rededication. I think that was a great move. Uh, they're trying to get the land back for the Montrose school. Uh, someone did an estimate, I think they looked at the shopping center to the north. Uh, this piece of property can't be another shopping center. The metro actually goes underneath it, so it would be difficult to maybe penetrate the ground, but uh, they, uh, Peerless Rockville, they got an estimate from the state that it was about 290 <laughs> Uh, million thousand dollars. They sent the 10% check in and they're hoping that that piece of 
uh, accepted. I did communicate with the State Secretary Ports on transportation and asked them to take a second look at that. So I think it would be great to get that school back. The Montgomery County DOT, they need about a tenth of uh, property for a sidewalk extension. I'm curious what their estimate might be for that property. So any insight you might have or support for that would be great. Thank you. It's a pleasure working with my associates and staff. So thank you. And now we have the uh, in with the, I don't want to say old, but not really new. <laughs> this is really an honor to be here as a, as a board member. Um, it's, it's been a quick six months, and um, I, as you know, I'm up for re reappointment. So um, anyway, but what I wanted to tell you was that um, it's really everything that I thought um, and more. There are issues that I'm dealing with that I didn't expect. You, you think that after 16 years working at the, uh, at the planning, at, at the commission, uh, whether in parks or in planning, I would know most everything that the board does, but I get surprised every week, sometimes every day, and I, um, I'm just having a great time. I really, um, you know, I hope and I, uh, that, I'm, that I'm contributing the way that I said I would. Um, I have been, just so you're aware, going around and talking to a lot of the folks who supported me in my, my, um, my quest. And um, so far, they say I haven't been there long enough to get in trouble. So, <laughs> so anyway, I'm um, I'm surprised. Yesterday, for example, I went on a, a parks tour, and I really appreciate uh, that Mike and his staff took me to the up county. I'm more familiar with the down county, but I got to see the Germantown Urban Park and really in detail. Um, we spent a couple hours at the uh, South Germantown. Recreation Park, and I did not know about pump tracks. I did not know about archery, and um, I am surprised at how many different types of, of of recreational opportunities that we provide in our park system. And I can't even count. I can't figure out how many there are, but it's almost anything that anyone can think of. And I know that we're continuing to grow. Um, and offer additional opportunities to all of our residents and um, and even our visitors. And I think it's great. And I'm just thrilled to be on the board. And again, thank you for the opportunity to, to serve this county. And Carol was just up in Baltimore with Mike and me this morning, helping to negotiate for park mitigation as part of the Managed Lanes Project. So she's been uh, absolutely invaluable on so many uh, things, not just on Thursdays. And we have our new-ish vice chair, Pratap Verma. Thank you. Uh, you know, we've never been a stronger board under the leadership of Casey Anderson. He's really directed us in a, in a positive direction. And I have to say I've worked in a lot of different places internationally and domestically here. And the Parks and Planning Department, is, the professionals, the kind of work we're churning out is world class. It is easily the best department I've ever seen, uh, at least in this realm of work. And so we're continuing to do the, the work that's needed. Uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of constituent services. I have a policy that I don't say no, which is uh, good and bad. Uh, my phone number's out there and I attend civic association meetings well into the night, uh, but we need to do that. We need to put our name out there. And uh, I'm just always overwhelmed by all the achievement we are able to do in one year. So just wanted to say thank you again for allowing us to serve. Great. Thank, Thank you, you all so very much. much. All right, we're going to get to the Q&A now. Uh, I'm going to start with Chairman Reamer. Thanks. Um, great presentation. Uh, we're doing a lot of terrific work together, and we'll be taking up the Parks Capital Budget in a few minutes. Um, so I, I don't have a lot to say at the moment other than we'll be taking up the work program at committee. So the way we do these processes, we review the work program at this biennial check-in. We take it up at the committee and then we adopt it as a council. So uh, there's a couple ideas that are percolating around, uh, uh, for example, looking at the cost of development, and uh, which of course relates to our ability to get what we want. Um, and uh, you know, for my colleagues, if you've got an idea, uh, now's a good time to put it out there. Well, not in this moment, but in this, uh, you know, over the next week or so. Um, 
and uh, we can we can take a look at it. So, great team. Thank you very much. And uh, back to you, Mr. Council President. Thank you so much. I've got uh, actually Councilmember Jawando's in the queue, followed by Councilmember Friedson, then Council Vice President Glass, and then Councilmember Katz. Right, Fed Committee goes first. That, that, that sounds good. Um, good to see everybody, and welcome to our great board um, and commission members and all the. I was just remarking to Councilmember Katz. I mean, they have the the staff is all. That's like half the staff right there. Um, we use the term army. I, I did. I did. In a good in a good way, um, they heard the cafeteria was getting renovated. So. <laughs> <laughs> you just rub it in, don't you? You just rub it in, you know. But to our public, you know, they have a very nice. Please visit and, and ask for Casey Anderson when you go down to to the Wheaton to the Wheaton uh, uh, building. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, but no, I just wanted to say, always impressed. Uh, really appreciated. Uh, Commissioner Verma's comments about the professionalism and you know I don't we don't none of us always agree on everything but you always are prepared and you come with you're doing great work and and I always appreciate the little nuggets that uh, um, our great parks director puts down and he he picked my home elementary school field Oakview Elementary to show and I, I know he knows that when he does it and I appreciate it um, and it looks it looks really good, and you just do it. It's just a small sampling of the great work that you're doing across the county in the planning department. Uh, I want to give a special shout out to um, Director Wright. Uh, I think several of us, I know Councilmember Glass, I think, and, and others have been aware of and even participated in some of the canvassing that is happening around Thrive. Uh, it's a it's a good addition and layer to what uh, needs to constantly be improvement of how we get deeper. Uh, into our very uh, diverse community and find out what they need and how they need it. And uh, it's a good example. So uh, excited to take up the CIP uh, and the operating budget, but uh, really appreciate all the work that you're doing. And Ms. Rubin, welcome. Uh, good to see you as well. Thank you. Thank you. So I've got Councilmember Friedson, followed by Vice President Glass, then Councilmember Katz, then Councilmember Rice, then Councilmember Navarro. Councilmember Friedson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, great presentation. Really uh, appreciate uh, the breadth of work that is happening uh, in the Parks Department and in the Planning Department. I will say I think the, I guess the army of, of staff is here to make sure that you don't get too uh, comfortable with how nice your building is. So make sure you can see the difference of uh, your building uh, and, 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 and our building, which uh, uh, we appreciate it, but we'll welcome you back once uh, once and if we get the cafeteria uh, uh, here open. But um, appreciate all the work. I, I will say uh, we could talk about parks for quite a long time, and there'll be opportunities to do that. But the field renovations in particular, you showed White Oak, which is extraordinary to see that. And many of us have you know, saw what that looked like before and, and, and know the difference of what it looks like now. And I think the field renovations in general uh, it just makes a, a world of difference uh, to uh, our residents, particularly our young people who are, uh, are are taking advantage of that. And then just the wide array of uh, activities and the activations that we're seeing, you know, the ongoing uh, activities and activations, but then the one-off uh, events to really engage uh, residents uh, with uh, a wide array of, of, of backgrounds and interests. So I just wanted to, to note that and, and, and appreciate that. Um, Two uh, questions uh, for planning. One, uh, Ms. Red, I appreciate I'm very excited about the Friendship Heights uh, study. I, I think there's real opportunity here. There's a lot of uh, energy behind what's happening uh, in D.C. Uh, on the D.C. side, long awaited. Uh, you know, Montgomery County has certainly done more uh, on the Friendship Heights side than, than D.C. has, and D.C. is finally doing quite a lot. And now we hopefully can catch up to what, what, what they're doing and work together. There's a lot of effort and interest in uh, collaboration uh, there, uh, cross-jurisdictional efforts, including uh, uh, some work with uh, an alliance that uh, perhaps would be a, a pre-bid effort, and the county executive uh, has uh, been working on that, and I've been working on that, and there's some funding in the budget uh, to match what uh, D.C. Uh, is doing. And so I was hoping you could just describe a little bit of uh, you know, kind of how you foresee uh, that moving forward uh, uh, there. And then uh, one additional question, I'll just ask them both and then uh, turn to you, uh, related to um, design in Bethesda uh, in particular. We have a review panel, uh, a new approach. A number of the nice pictures that you showed were of 
uh, new Bethesda buildings and just wanted to uh, get your sense of uh, how that relatively new process, uh, it feels like it's an old process given the long list of uh, activities that you uh, you mentioned, but in the scheme of, uh, of, of planning, it really is a relatively new process. If you could just describe how you see uh, that working in terms of the quality of the architecture and, and, and design and the community input that's uh, being received on that. Thanks. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll address the second one first and then go back to the question about Friendship Heights. Um, one of the things that I was uh, pleased to bring from my experience in Alexandria was this idea of uh, design excellence and design advisory boards. There are multiple design advisory boards in Alexandria for different parts of that community. When we undertook the Bethesda plan, we introduced the idea of a design advisory panel, and uh, it, I think, has been uh, enormously successful. The design advisory panel is made up of individuals who both have design backgrounds, but also who are from the Bethesda community. And in fact, one specific slot is for um, someone who is from uh, the adjacent uh, community. He also happens to be an architect uh, and has a lot of great ideas. Um, so uh, we have, I think, been very successful in interpreting the design guidelines, which are also a part of the planning process, but in having the design advisory panel work with applicants uh, and with the community. All of the design advisory panel meetings are open to the public. Uh, members of the public uh, have attended. Uh, it's an opportunity in a very transparent way to talk about design issues that come up in the implementation of the Bethesda Master Plan. And we've really heard from a number of people in the development community who were a little nervous about this process uh, that it actually has been beneficial, that they feel like the inpu input and advice that they've gotten from the design advisory panel has actually helped them uh, make a better project, end up with a better project. So we think it's been incredibly successful. We are recommending a similar approach in the Silver Spring plan, and I know we'll be talking about that with the Fed Committee. Um, but again, you know, lessons learned from Alexandria. I can't keep bringing those back. And uh, definitely the idea of uh, design advisory panels um, has, has translated well into Montgomery County, at least with our experience with the Bethesda design advisory panel. In terms of Friendship Heights, we have been uh, actively participating with um, the DC Office of Planning in work that they've been doing. They had a Urban Land Institute technical advisory panel and um, <clears throat> Robert Cronenberg, our deputy planning director, participated in that uh, uh, technical advisory panel, which went on for a couple of days to look at options in Friendship Heights. I think the, um, we are aware of the idea of um, the idea of a bid uh, type structure uh, that would be probably for both the DC and Maryland parts of Friendship Heights. A lot of the issues in Friendship Heights are not, mm -hmm. uh, you know, planning issues because we think there's plenty of density and zoning and so forth. Really, a lot of the uh, issues in Friendship Heights are uh, operational. Uh, our placemaking issues are um, ways to build out the plan that was approved low those many years ago. I think it was 1996 or so. It's quite an old plan, but a lot of it still has the opportunity to be built out. And um, we think that doing an urban design study, just, just in the way that we, um, we did the project for White Flint, which was called Advancing the Pike District, and we're now doing a project in downtown Wheaton. It's not an idea of creating a new plan or new zoning, but really talking about how to implement the existing plans and how to move those plans forward uh, to full fruition. And uh, that's what we uh, anticipate in Friendship Heights. Thank you. Uh, appreciate it. There's a lot of uh, interest and excitement, I think, from all stakeholders, particularly in 
Friendship Heights. So appreciate it. Look forward to that uh, effort. I'll get back to you, Mr. President. Thanks. Thank you. Council Vice President Glass. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, everybody who's on the panel and uh, your army of lieutenants and foot soldiers doing the good work on behalf of all, all residents here. I, I was very intrigued by the presentation um, and just have uh, two particular questions. One of them is with regard to the demographic information that was shared. And uh, Chair Anderson, you uh, I think it was you, Chair Anderson, um, uh, or Director Wright, but you were talking about the growth areas in the county, and particularly you were talking about downtown Silver Spring and the uh, what would seem a, a, a tough contradiction, right, in which there was tremendous growth. There is tremendous growth in downtown Silver Spring. The amount as a track share of residents of low-income means has decreased, but that the total number of low-income residents within that community has actually increased. And so I would interpret that, and I'd love to hear your thoughts as well, I, I would interpret that in that the growth and the density has afforded space for everybody. What do you think? That's exactly right. We believe that fresh public and private investment in Silver Spring has succeeded in creating a broadly shared, uh, high-quality place that contributes to everyone's well-being. And uh, it's I think that there's this false choice between uh, redevelopment, market rate, new projects, especially housing at high price points, and uh, the idea of trying to make sure that people who are already there are also the beneficiaries of what comes next. And um, I think we'll have more to say about that. Um, I don't want to step on our own punchline, but uh, we think that there's a lot more interesting information that's to be mined from that. And uh, you can see it's not very many census tracts in Montgomery County or the region where that's true, but there is a very strong relationship between the census tracts where there's been a lot of new development and the places where there have been not only no displacement, but actually an increase in people of every income level, increases across the board. So no one, not only is no one getting pushed out, we're creating a more welcoming place that accommodates all kinds of people. And I think you'll be interested in seeing some of the racial and ethnic demographics that go along with that, which again are uh, contrary to what you might expect. I'll wait for your punchline, Director, right? What he said. What he said, <laughs> that's your punchline. Uh, uh, so thank you for that. I look forward to that continued conversation, but I think that is a, uh, a really important point for all of us to be cognizant of. Uh, what can be extrapolated from that will, uh, will be determined, quite frankly, uh, but I'm glad to hear of it and look forward to, to what is to come. Um, switching gears uh, to the parks, um, and I'll look at uh, Director Riley. Uh, I, over the last year or so, a number of residents in, in various communities have come to me, and I just want to express my appreciation for you and your team, whether it was the refresh in the Long Branch Park or, quite frankly, some cosmetic work at Cherrywood Park up in Olney. Uh, I know that you all were quick to it, and the residents have really appreciated uh, your attention. Another thing that residents have been contacting me about with ever greater frequency is pickleball. And you're all nodding, yes. Um, they want more pickleball. And I know that in the Park Recreation and Open Space Plan, which I think was written in 2017, uh, pickleball didn't rank that high in that. I think it was 20 out of 23 on various uh, rankings um, and scoring. But uh, I, is that up for renewal, that, that plan? Can you elaborate a little bit more for all of the people in Montgomery County who are eager to play pickleball in their community. Yeah, it's it's up for renewal now, and we are hearing strongly from pickleball advocates. Um, we we know we need to add more. We've had success. We've added courts, but we. I had one planner, unfortunately, who retired, but he dedicated his last whole year to nothing but pickleball. And uh, once I replace that position, we'll have a new ambassador to be communicating with the pickleball community. But we do have plans, and I can detail them to anybody who's interested about how and where we are adding pickleball capacity in the park system. Glad to hear that. Uh, 
I think the punchline there is that as Montgomery County continues aging, we already have the largest percentage of seniors in the DMV here in Montgomery County as a share of our total population. And so the amenities and what they'll be seeking is changing. And I think pickleball is the canary in the coal mine there. Uh, and I'm glad to hear that you, you and I saw the collective nods of your team as well. So that is reassuring and I will share that with those who contact me uh, frequently. So thank you all for the presentation. I look forward to all the continued conversations. Thank you. Councilmember Katz followed by Councilmember Rice and then Councilmember Navarro. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you all very much for your presentation. Um, and, and I guess I'd like to start out by congratulating you on hiring people who do need that second chance. Uh, you know, in, in some cases, you're their, their best chance to, to get back on track. And of course, we're doing other things uh, in corrections as well. I mean, we're talking about bringing back a bakery uh, uh, so somebody could learn to, uh, to be a baker in, in when, if they're incarcerated, when they're incarcerated. We've given uh, scholarships to Montgomery College, but a job is so very important, even when they're at Montgomery College, to, to allow them to get to that, that next best step. So congratulations on, on doing that. I, my uh, question also goes to what uh, Vice President Glass was talking about. The whole idea of the, like the track, and on, and on the slide, I think it was slide three, uh, Casey, you had a Lake Forest Mall track. And my first question is, how big was the track? And secondly, much of that is within the city of Gaithersburg. So how much of the information that you are getting, are, are you working with the city of Gaithersburg to figure out how, how we got there and what we need to do? Well, the data comes from the census. So we're taking federal right. you know, data. Uh, we didn't mean to pick on Lake Forest Mall, but it's well, it just, needs to be picked. To win. It, it's does, seven it does pop out as yeah. the, as the most dramatic uh, rate and amount of change, uh, frankly, in the wrong direction. Yep. And yeah, I think you can only call it concentration of poverty. And uh, I don't think that's news to the city of Gaithersburg. I think we all we all know it. Um, but it's I think that my takeaway from this is. Contrary to the conventional narrative that we should be primarily focused in land use planning with the possibility that new investment is going to lead to displacement, that is an issue in a few places. But it's much more commonly the case that the problem is that poverty is being concentrated, neighborhoods are being abandoned by people who can afford to live somewhere else. Those are the places we need to be at least as concerned about as the places where there's, there's displacement. Yes, displacement can be a problem, but also uh, concentration of poverty is terrible for, and there's a lot of work by, there's an academic, Raj Chetty, who's done a lot of work on life outcomes for children who grew up in neighborhoods, where, high opportunity neighborhoods. We wanna make sure that all of our neighborhoods in Montgomery are high opportunity places for children to grow up and get to something better. I mean, that's the American dream, to get to something better than what your, par what your parents had. And I think that we want to put that on the agenda as being at least as important as gentrification, considering what it means to have a racially, ethnically equitable, and socioeconomically equitable ag public agenda for what our agency does and what this council does, what everything we do in local government. But, and I, and I appreciate what you said, but in most cases, Lake Forest obviously had no one living there. I mean, that's, that was, right now they have no, uh, no commercial living there either, as far as that goes, very little. But, but Lake Forest itself was not residential. Surrounding it obviously is, I mean, not, not Asbury. I mean, that's certainly not, uh, though it might have been in that tract. I, I don't know, you know, from the census tract. But, but Asbury certainly is a very different place. But the, the um, other areas around Lake Forest, though Lake Forest is in the city of Gaithersburg, the other areas are in Montgomery County, uh, Montgomery Village and, and you know, all those, other, all those other concentrations. So there needs to be a, a coordination, is my point, so that, we, that when things are gonna be changed, which they will, that, we, that we're all working together to make certain that that, that that change is the most positive that we can possibly have. Uh, absolutely, and I think we're really looking forward, I, and Gwen may be able to address the timing on some of these 
uh, Montgomery Village approvals. I know that's been a little bit of a stop start sort of a, of a problem, but I, I think that we're optimistic that the Montgomery Village plan that you approved just a few years ago is really going to get some momentum behind it and, and bring some new housing, new amenities, revitalize some of the, the, those uh, shopping centers. Um, and obviously, we, we want to work with the city of Gaithersburg. They'll have their own issues with how to get the sure. Lake Forest Mall redeveloped. But yeah, we can give you some more information about that census tract. I think it includes that area of Lost Knife Road and the area immediately uh, right. adjacent to the, county. Pro mm -hmm. to the mall. Yeah. And I did want to assure you, we meet on um, a semi-regular basis with the staff from City of Gaithersburg uh, Planning Department. And um, we actually have had, in the last couple of months, our first in-person meeting with them again, uh, which again, we haven't been able to have for a while, but we did and we all shared information about the projects that we all were working on. So we are working on maintaining that coordination. And I think we're all focused on, you know, that Montgomery Village is an area that we want to see positive change. I think that was some of the discussion during the corridor forward plan was, you know, adding some transportation opportunities uh, and we have been reviewing a few uh, regulatory cases. I think you all were at the uh, Lytle uh, opening yeah. and there is a uh, potential project next to it that's a residential project. So there are some good things happening. Very good. Well, thank you all very much for what you're doing and I will yield back, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Rice. So, you know, it's interesting as my colleagues and I were talking about your doorstop that you had here, um, you know you're from Montgomery County when you can identify what this road is. Oh, but there's a correction. Uh oh. I was wrong. Uh oh. I was wrong. Well, let's let's make it a contest. Who who thinks they know where this road is? Does anybody know what road this is? Well, I thought we were in Mid County. Said Mid County. It's George Avenue in Aspen Hill. Ah, yeah, I thought it was Old go. George Chen too. There I, we so, go. But I, I was correct. So, so it's interesting because as we think about what has changed so much, um, and when I look at George Avenue, and now I see exactly what you're talking about, it, it's, um, it's one that it encompasses so much of what Ms. Wright listed when we talk about the planning and what we've been able to accomplish over the short nine years that you've been planning director and the longer amount of time that council member Navarro and I have been a part of this council council member Reamer as well and it really is something to reflect upon what has changed because I do think uh, director I understand that what you're talking about in terms of seeing uh, that level of success in growing some of those areas and regions in terms of affordability on multiple levels is incredibly important and it was something that Councilmember Navarro and I were just talking about in her role at the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments and just talking about the fact as we build more housing we know that it benefits everyone at all of the various levels and it's very clear that those that are moving and matriculating on from lower income housing to middle income housing because they've stabilized and had the ability to save up money and they grow their families and they're moving on to the next means that that now is open for that next family to go into that entry level housing. It is not just about building lower income housing that makes sure that we affect people who need lower income housing. And so I think that's important because I don't know if everybody always says that and gets that. Um, but I think that it's an important story for us to make sure that we're telling and we're seeing the success of it. So it's not just the theoretical, it's actually that we're actually seeing the direct results of the work and the planning that folks have put in, many of which are seated behind you. And so from that standpoint, I just want to say kudos because it's incredibly important for me as a person who was born and raised here to be able to still say that folks that are coming up like me will be able to still afford to live here in this great county that offers so many of the amenities that we're also talking about. So thank you, Director Wright. Thank you, uh, Chair uh, Anderson. And so now I want to turn to you, Mr. Riley, because I think that, again, when we talk about 
uh, the accoutrements, all the great things that are of Montgomery County. It truly is one in which quality of life matters so much. And it is the tipping point oftentimes when it comes to where people decide to live. Uh, there are so many opportunities now, especially uh, with the way we've transitioned over the past few years to folks being able to do remote work. Uh, I was actually traveling back from a conference. Um, I was actually at a conference with uh, uh, our new uh, superintendent of Montgomery County Public Schools, uh, Dr. McKnight, and I was flying back from Atlanta and was talking with a couple that was sitting next to me on the plane, and she was talking about a job interview. And I said, because we were headed back to BWI, and I said, oh, so you're moving to Atlanta. She said, no, it's actually remote. I'm actually gonna be able to do my work here in the Washington metropolitan area, but my you know home headquarters and the office is still in Atlanta. And it really does say something because again, as we compete, right? Everyone always talks about commercial and that is absolutely true. We do need to have jobs here, but we also need to have the quality of life here too because there is another option that is this remote workforce that is growing uh, and those opportunities are there. And so we've got to make sure that we're firing on all cylinders when it comes to speaking to individuals. And so I say that because Mr. Riley, when it comes to what it is that we are doing in diversifying our offerings uh, to individuals, that is that quality of life. Thank you for listening and working with us to continue to make sure that we're focusing on equity and social justice when it comes to what it is that we're doing and continuing to commit to making sure that all of these things are delivered to all of our constituents. As I look back and I think about the myriad of projects that you and I have worked on, but not even just you and I, that you have worked on colleagues across this day is with, it is truly about furthering that, miss it, that, 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 that mission of equity and social justice. When I think about all of those communities that have folks that don't have the time to come here, and talk to us about issues. They don't have the time to understand how it works in terms of the squeaky wheel getting the grease. And us instead saying, you know what? You don't have to come to us because we know we're coming to you and we're talking to you about the issue. So having those listening sessions, having those opportunities to talk, having an opportunity to go out and look at a field and see it just because someone didn't call you, but because it's something that you know is important to be done is incredibly important. And so I just wanna close with um, a story because it's an example of exactly what happens when we build stuff. Um, I was driving to Clarksburg via the back way uh, from my house in Darnstown and was passing by. Uh, Mr. Anderson knows all too well the entrance to one of our mountain bike trails that's right at Black Hills. And I mentioned to my mother and daughter, I said, oh, that's the mountain bike entrance that I went with Casey Anderson on. And it's so cool. And we saw a whole bunch of people lining up, headed down to about to turn onto the, uh, onto the trail. And my daughter says to me in the back, she says, dad, that's pretty cool. Maybe I should try that. Now, again, for anybody who's a father, um, you know all too well, you can't get excited. Uh, so I had to play it cool which I did, and I was like, yeah, I mean, if you want to, you know, whatever. But secretly, <laughs> secretly inside, I was very excited uh, about the fact of the potential as I now was inspired by my ride with Casey Anderson to create, I built my own bike. Um, and, and actually was challenged in doing this by purchasing a base bike from, and I wanna tell the story because I think it's important. I hope that other people listen to this. Um, a base bike from Walmart and actually started purchasing other pieces from Amazon that were a little souped up because the frame itself is not necessarily always, it's one of the most expensive parts of the bicycle, but it's not always the part that matters so much. Suspension and all other kinds of things, and you can actually make it uh, a mountain bike out of these other parts for a very low price compared to buying one that's a high level uh, mountain bike. And so I say that because I think that again, the more we expose people to what it is that's out there, the more opportunity we're gonna have for people to access all the great things that we have. And so I encourage us all to continue to talk about the great amenities that we have here, talk about the great quality of life that we have here, talk about the opportunities that we have here that are all encompassed 
in what we see you reporting on from this semi-annual plan. This is truly about making sure that Montgomery County is one of the best places to live, work, and play, not only in this region, but in this nation. And you all deserve thanks for making that happen. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Navarro. This is kind of a special day. There's been a theme the whole entire day, which is kind of creeping me out a little. Um, because for me personally, it does feel like um, it's, it's, it's almost like just like a movie of, of uh, connecting again. I'll say that again. So many dots. And so, um, yeah, I mean, um, ditto to, to, to everything that has just been said. Um, you know, when I, when I look at those slides and, and I see these buildings, um, I, I do have, of course, a little bit of, um, you know, there are moments where it's, it's kind of like, I can't believe, look, look at the Marriott, downtown Bethesda, and, uh, and just a reminder of uh, all those nights and all those public hearings and all that correspondence and all that uh, concern, extreme concern, um, but it's the same with so many of those master plans that were listed. And, um, and it's almost like you have to act, you know, by faith, right? Planning is nothing, there's no certainty. Planning, uh, and, and I oftentimes when I speak to particular pockets in our community, I always say, you know, it's a difference between just letting something just happen uh, without any thought. Um, having been, you know, born in Caracas, Venezuela, that's kind of like what happened there. It's the difference between that and at least putting in some foresight and, and a vision and some parameters so that hopefully you get the best possible outcome. It is, the, it is the difference between those two things. And so this is just so extraordinarily exciting. I mean, that particular data point around this notion of what's happening in the downtown Silver Spring surrounding area, it's like a case study. And, and I would love for us to have an additional session just to kind of really delve down into that particular proposal, because let's think about the history of, of all of that. Right, I think it's how Impact Silver Spring was born. It was out of the discussions of what was going to happen in downtown Silver Spring, and and it's just we have to. And I'll be honest, I think that a lot of this has to do with the fact that we all have worked collectively to incorporate all the voices in our county, because people always assume that certain people in our community have a particular perspective and our opinion. When in reality, you know, especially when we're talking about our communities of color and our immigrant community, you know, in reality, that rich input, I think, also has really helped us get to this place. Uh, and so I'm, I'm just in awe. I mean, I'm in awe of, 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 of a lot of the things I saw here. I'm so excited about this equity opportunity index that I see in here as well, that it, it is about being structural. That's extraordinary. Um, so many things and you know to the staff that is here this army i want to say you're welcome for the downtown wheaton headquarters <laughs> that everybody keeps touting you're welcome um no but joke aside so proud of all of that right because that is going to absolutely things like that are just an imprint of what is possible here in our county and, and, and really to push back on this fear, you know, this, this constant fear that is thrown out there about what we should do or not do. I, 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 it's, it's just awesome. So, so thank you. Um, I also, you know, will confess that going for a walk with my daughter, um, who's about to move to the West Coast, uh, to one of our uh, trails, you know, and I said to her, you know, every single time I, I do this, it's, it's another affirmation for why I love this county so much, right? Of, you know, of just appreciating what we have here and the care and the love um, for all of our, you know, natural spaces and just to see everyone there, everyone there. Um, it's, it's, just, it's just wonderful. And, and uh, so, you know, this, this, these two years have been so hard, but I think they have really centered our focus. Um, and that's what I'm seeing here. Um, and so kudos to all of you once again, um, no doubt. Um, wow, it's, it's just been a lot of work, all these master plans, but I know that we will be noticing how it is all connected and how it will help us uh, with many of these extraordinary challenges ahead and opportunities. Um, so good work, it's awesome, thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Reamer, and then I have a, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, Councilmember Reamer. Well, I just want to say we all, I think, paid close attention to, to that chart showing the difference in uh, opportunity in downtown Silver Spring uh, and our ability to add more affordable housing as we are adding more housing generally. And to Councilmember Navarro's comment there, we'll make that an emphasis when we bring the Silver Spring Master Plan, which we're presently working on at the Fed Committee, when we bring it to the full council. Let's have that deeper dive so we can help see that context, because sometimes in these plans we get right to the zoning and we get right to, you know, the operation of what we're trying to achieve here. But uh, it's a great point. I think several council members have made it. You know, I think if you're not growing, you're declining. I, I think that's really what the, your chart is showing. And I think that's a big question for this county as a whole and for lots of different communities uh, specifically. And so we'll make sure we uh, dive into that deeper. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, I won't take long because we, we have a lot more that we need to get through this afternoon and I'll follow up specifically with individual questions, but begin by associating myself with all the comments of my, by my colleagues and the massive kudos for the remarkable work and that's gone into all the projects that were listed today. And I'll just note, I was struck during the CIP testimony from the public that they kept connecting our parks to mental health and how they all saw that as such an important path forward during some extraordinarily difficult times for all of us. And so those investments are going to be critically important moving forward. Um, I just had a couple of questions with regards to fields. So I'm very impressed uh, with the quality that we've been able to produce. And how, are we tracking outcomes in terms of overall participation on these fields? Are we seeing an increase uh, in demand because we're enhancing the overall supply, which I would assume is also enhancing the demand? Um, but how is that alleviating some of the pressure off of some of the other fields that have long-standing wait lists to be able to use, and are we seeing that making a dent in any way? Uh, it's a great question. I'm probably going to have to come back to you with any numbers on permitting and demand after a little analysis, but I, I will say one of the things I observe is a lot of the competition for fields is geographically based. We just have, we have field capacity but people want fields in particular locations and a lot of those fields quite often are booked up through historical use policies um, but I'll, I'll come back to you with the answer about the relationship between improved quality and increased demand i'm not sure how to answer that at this point thank you Jim the other piece of good news is that cup is fine and is finally replacing the reservation software ActiveNet, which was really not great from a consumer or user's experience, but it's even worse with the back end. We could not, we really were unable to get any useful data out of it. And I think the new software package will allow us to track some of those questions a lot more easily so we can give you quick and uh, accurate answers to questions like that. I appreciate that. I've got scars from ActiveNet. I see colleagues in recreation in the audience. Um, so just a couple of other uh, just thoughts, but the, the narrative continues to be a negative overall in Montgomery County with regards to development, but these slides are directly counter to that. And the facts on the ground don't always correspond to the rhetoric that we're hearing by some. So I think that we need to, uh, we, all of us collectively, the council as well, uh, need to be, need to do a better job of telling that story, telling that narrative, um, and pushing back on some of the misinformation that is not helpful. Uh, and is self-defeating in many ways. Um, and so I look forward to working with you all on that. And from a communication standpoint too, being creative uh, in how we develop those messages with well-placed op-eds, um, but also just making sure that people know we're here open for business clearly as evidenced by uh, the amount of permits that have been requested. So um, I, I could go on and on, I won't, uh, but thank you all very much um, for your remarkable leadership on many different levels. I always look forward to these presentations, my colleagues do as well, and we look forward to the next one next year. Thank you all. And parks can stay uh, because we are now moving on to the next item on the agenda, which is a work session regarding the FY23 through 28 CIP. And we will start with item number 17, uh, which is our parks department. Uh, Chairman Reamer. 
All right, we will give this a moment to transition as Pam Dunn will come forward and the parks team will take its seats. Thanks to all the planning staff, appreciate your work. And the commission members. All right. Um, the Planning, Housing, Economic Development Committee met to discuss the capital improvement program for the Parks Department. And this was a budget where we have, you know, we had a little bit of a challenge. We weren't, the executive's recommended budget did not uh, provide adequate funding um, and instead stuck a new, albeit important, but a new project into the parks capital budget uh, that wasn't previously there. And so we were trying to figure out how to absorb uh, a significant new item in that budget and at the same time keep projects on track. And uh, that's kind of hard to do. Uh, you can't uh, just make up money. So we had to make choices and we're making recommendations to uh, the council to add some funding so that important projects can continue to move forward on a t in a timely manner. Um, and so I want to thank my colleagues on the committee and uh, our lead for parks, Councilmember Friedson. Um, I could turn it to you if you'd like to make some comments and then we can go back to the budget. Um, all right, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll proceed. Um, but appreciate your accessibility and meeting with residents all across the county on critical park issues. People know they can call you when they want to talk to a council member about these important issues. Um, so Pam is here to uh, walk us through the specifics, but if you if you start from, you know, I think the summary uh, is helpful. I guess I'll turn it to you, Pam, to kind of walk us through and then I'll join the conversation as we go because there's a number of critical issues that I think we want to talk about together as a body. Great. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, so uh, you have a cover sheet that comes with your staff report for this item, but if you turn to the first page of the staff report, um, we do have some brief uh, summary there. I'll go through that with the with the council, and then the way I'll structure it is to call out um, places where the committee made either a change in recommendation for something that's before the council. If um, an item was before the committee, even if it was a change to the CIP, meaning it was typically adding slightly more money within the six-year period, maybe across all six years, um, where it was not in, um, where it was unanimously agreed upon by the committee, I won't necessarily call those out, but they are all in the staff report for you to see. Um, then we'll proceed through. Um, looking at the ways in which the Parks Department and the committee um, discussed trying to come together to meet that gap with the um, executive's recommended budget. So to start off, the uh, MNCPPC CIP request for the FY2328 um, CIP program is $265 million, and this is an increase of $25.4 million, or 10.6% over the amended FY21 to 26 CIP. Um, the CIP is submitted by MNC PPC. It consists of 41 projects. There's one new project and 40 ongoing. The county executive's recommended budget is $254.5 million. It is a 6.2% increase from the previously approved budget. However, half of this increase is proposed to fund the commission's work on behalf of the county toward the county's MS4 permit, and it is in the term of long-term financing. Uh, the executive's recommended budget excluding this additional funding um, earmarked for the county's MS4 permit represents a 2.5% increase over the amended FY21 through 26 CIP. Um, it's 7.3% less than the budget requested by MNC PPC. So they just mentioned there is one new project. It is called Park Acquisitions. It is actually a combination of two existing uh, projects. One is uh, acquisitions for local parks and acquisitions for non-local parks. And so the department is asking that there just be one PDF. This provides some flexibility. It will require some tracking on the way uh, money is allocated and funded because certain funding sources can only go to local parks, certain others to non-local parks. But it does provide flexibility um, for funding sources that can go to either one. 
Um, and these again are the committee recommendations uh, are in agreement with these. The general obligation bond funding for ball fields initiative projects. Um, there was a, a decision to defer talking about um, the use of CUP funding at this time as that is usually something discussed during the operating budget. Uh, but the committee did propose um, $300,000 per year in GEO bonds. Be okay. Great. Pam, I want to pause you on the ball fields because mm -hmm. we've got a couple of uh, sentences to add into that project item on Johnson's local park. Sure. It's not in your packet, but we did discuss it at committee. So I think this would be the appropriate time. Yep. Okay, Fine. great. So as, as Pam was saying, we proposed fund additional funding for the ball fields initiative, as well as deferring conversation about funding to the cup conversation, which is forthcoming as there's multiple sources of revenue for the ball fields initiative. So we wanted to address the part that was within the Fed Committee's jurisdiction and then pass it on to E&C uh, for CUP. Um, but as we were talking about that and in uh, Mike Riley's presentation about the parks program, you saw a visual about Johnson's local park and untold stories of Montgomery County. Uh, I think many council members at this point have had a chance to talk to community leaders from the Emory Grove area to uh, community leaders in the baseball community, like Bruce Adams, to HOC, who's doing a significant development in that area. And there is a very uh, important historical park there, Johnson's Local Park, which was once the site of the premier baseball field for the Negro Leagues in Montgomery County. And it had lights, and the geography of the park had a very large, still does, a very large berm all the way down the side. And it was part, it was a community gathering spot that drew people not only for baseball, but for religious services and food and fun, thousands of people uh, on a given Sunday or Saturday. And uh, that park, over time, I guess the lights were removed and housing somewhat encroached into what was once the, you know, the general area. Uh, but on the on the good positive side, there is a large scale redevelopment vision that is proceeding for Emory Grove. It's very exciting, and the council will be taking that up in the future. We wanted to get the ball rolling, or uh, so to speak, on improving the baseball field and providing some historical interpretation. So we don't want to get ahead of ourselves, and you know call for something that we can't achieve. We're looking for a great baseball field that is very, you know, consistent, I think, in, at least to start with, with what you see there. Um, you know, we're, we're going to improve the baseball experience. Um, but we're, we want to add some historical interpretation. And so Parks has provided some language to showcase that history. And I'm sure you can all imagine, you know, that ideally, every baseball league and team, softball too, will have a chance to play this field. And those kids and adults will go see this county's history in a way that otherwise they just might never know. Um, now, I wanna chat up for the president of the council and council member Friedson and others, uh, council member Katz who've got thoughts on this uh, as well as have been working on this uh, for the past year or so. So I'll pass it to you, Mr. Council President. I am really excited about this project. You would never know by visiting that local park that the history that's there is there. And there was a traveling baseball team at the time in the 1950s called the Indianapolis Clowns, which was like the Harlem Globetrotters of baseball. And Hank Aaron and Satchel Paige played for that team and played on that field. So uh, the history is extraordinary. And when you look at, there are still some images that you can find uh, of, of artist renditions of what the field used to look like and of the gathering place that that was for the community, it really is extraordinary. And there were also some um, world-class musicians uh, that also played in that general vicinity as well at the time. So um, I think it makes a heck of a lot of sense for us to resurrect in a reasonable fashion uh, a park that you know once re-engaged with support from the community, we wanna make sure there's support um, but that can really achieve even more and is directly in line with what this council is moving forward in ensuring sports equity, uh, which I think is really exciting as well. So um, I know other colleagues want to speak about this. Councilmember Friedson. 
Yeah, I appreciate all the work on this. I think it's really exciting and, and certainly one of the uh, you know historic gems that we have that we can really showcase uh, as part of uh, the park system, as part of Montgomery County. Uh, America's past and baseball are intrinsically linked. There is this uh, unique connection, uh, and that's true with the positive. That's true with the negative. Uh, of uh, America's past, and we have the opportunity, I think, uh, to to uh, to memorialize that in a in a really profound way, and do it in a way that's engaging uh, for everybody, and that's relevant uh, in telling the past, and also providing opportunities in the in the present, which I think is uh, really important. Um, and uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity to engage community organizations. This has already begun, and I know that work is continuing. And I will say, I think park and planning. Uh, is uniquely positioned, uh, having done some of the most important research and historical work when it comes to um, racial equity, when it comes to reckoning with our past. And so to, to have this opportunity for uh, the Parks Department to take it up and uh, to, to uh, be able to move it forward, I think is uh, really important. Appreciate all the work that uh, everybody has put into this. I don't know if you're moving this. I'm happy to second uh, it. Uh, so I'll, I'll not nod to you. I'll provide your second for the motion that I believe you are intending uh, to make with the language that you've provided uh, to colleagues. But I'd uh, preemptively be happy to, uh, to, to second that, Mr. Chair. Great. We have a motion and a second, uh, and Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much. I enthusiastically agree with you. I, I certainly remember Johnson Park. Now, I don't remember when Hank Aaron played there, but but uh, I certainly remember going past there for camp meetings and, and all of the excitement that that caused. I actually went to Longview Elementary, which is the elementary school next door to, uh, it's now, a, I think it's a now a rec center. Okay. But but it was uh, uh, um, the, uh, when schools integrated in Montgomery County, that was the African American or one of the African American elementary schools. And they bused students from Gaithersburg Elementary, the third and fourth grades, to go to, to, go to uh, Longview so that they didn't have to have the portables in, at Gaithersburg Elementary. So I was bused. We, we could walk to Gaithersburg Elementary, but I was bused in third and fourth grade there. And that's where I met my buddy, Greg Wims. And he and our lives have intertwined uh, since. So it truly is a historic spot. I think that you, uh, when you're putting all of the historic uh, information together, there are so many people, thank goodness, who are still alive that would remember what went on there. And uh, Reverend Tim Warner and many others who are still active in the, in the community certainly know many of them. But, but uh, this is truly an opportunity that if we don't do it, we are really missing a historic uh, moment, literally in every way. So uh, though it's already been second, I will be more than happy to be third. So thank you very much. Great. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hands. That is unanimous. Great. So we're amending the ball fields initiative to add the language uh, identifying that the ball fields and other funds will pay for improvements and upgrades, including historical interpretations to create a baseball field at that location. We look forward to seeing what a beautiful project that you'll develop. And, you know, we're starting here with what is practical. And uh, we appreciate your, your support very much. Okay. Pam, back to you. All right, thank you. Uh, if there are no other comments on the ball fields uh, project, again, I'm going to just go through the packet where there were places where the, um, the committee did not either unanimously support what's in your packet or had um, additional comments or changes. Um, the next one that that's the case for is on the 12th, uh, 11th page, and it's the stream protection um, project and again this one really just noting that this was the project where the county executive requested putting in 8.8 .8 million dollars into the CIP for the MS4 permit work that the Parks Department will do for the county um, and that is under long-term financing so it does not affect current revenue or our GO bonds and the committee supported that but I just wanted to call that out because it was in support of the CE's recommendation um, the next is okay. urban park and just to, as you said Sorry. before as Mike said I think this is the county's project, right? The, the, this, this is the uh, Stream Valley Stream Restorations for the MS4 permit. 
it's going to, uh, it's towards their MS4 permit. It's towards the county's But, it is, but it's going to be on our You're land. You're going to be building we're it. It's on your land. Do it, and we're going to do it on our credit. property, but we're going to get, we're going to credit the county's MS4 requirements. Right. Thanks. Yeah. She does. Yeah. Mary Beck uh, would like yeah. to speak. Yeah, I, I did just want to make it clear. I think Pam sort of mentioned it, but I just want to make sure everybody knows that's coming with the Water Quality Protection Act funding. So no, no competition with other parks priorities. And frankly, this is due to a wonderful partnership with Park. Their staff has been fantastic, and this has been a great partnership. Okay. Well said. Keep going, Pam. Great, thank you. Um, so the next is the urban parks element. This was a, a project that the uh, county executive also commented on. Um, the comment was in reference to a proposed dog park for Nor Norwood Park in Bethesda. Um, the council did receive quite a bit of correspondence on this. Probably about half the correspondence received on the park CIP came um, in reference to people um, who were less than thrilled with the idea of the dog park being added to Norwood Park for a variety of reasons. Uh, and so the committee discussed this and um, they decided that they were in support of the Parks Department looking for an alternative site for that dog park in the down county in the urban area. Um, but they didn't agree with uh, a further recommendation of the county executive, which was to delay the funding that was associated with that dog park and moving it two years farther into the CIP. So the funding stream is just staying as is. It can go to other items, but um, there is a, um, the, the dog park will not be part of that funding stream for now. Um, can I just add to that? Uh, the funding remains, and since that discussion, there has been a great deal of uh, interest in having a dog park in Friendship Heights. And so I know the Parks Department is reaching out with the community there, and um, you know that, that is a process that is ahead of us, so it's going to take months to work through, but at least from uh, you know initial feedback, it's well supported and and uh, you know people are very eager to see it happen. So um, uh, you know we're pleased to see the parks department can move forward with the dog park, and um, we'll look to uh, see how that develops and let us know how we can support. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Moving on, we are now in a section of the staff report called Projects for Approval by Consent. And these were projects that I put into the staff report sort of in following prior year's um, format where if the project was only requesting two additional years of funding at the same funding level, um, that is sort of not really a change of significance, but it was always before the committee and now it is before the council. Um, but these were not discussed in detail, nor was any questions raised about them. But I, again, wanted them before the council. Um, but unless anyone has um, an issue, we would move on to the next one. There's always a list of projects that are not recommended for funding. These are usually closing out the project. They are completed projects um, for the most part. And then there's the fifth section, which is probably the biggest um, one that um, garners conversation, which is the impact of the committee's recommendation on the affordability PDF. So as we mentioned in the beginning, the county executive recommends one budget and the Parks Department has put forth a different one and there is a gap of, if you exclude the money earmarked for the Stream Valley Protection, a difference in $19.4 million. So the Parks Department takes that into consideration. They meet with the planning board and they come up with a list of um, things that um, are the least impactful to their work program to satisfy these reductions. Um, and if you'll look on page 21 in the staff report and page 22, um, the first item is a deferral of $105,000 in MNCP PC bonds. These are just moved from FY25 into 26 and 27. Um, they still represent an increase over current funding levels in those years. They're just deferral and the Parks Department supported that change, was fine with it. Uh, but the second one is the reduction in current revenue and geo bond funding. This is the, the bigger issue um, and how to come together to, to meet that, that gap. You'll see on uh, the middle of page 22, the reconciliation PDF by the county executive recommended a decrease in current revenue of $4.982 million. The committee discussed the items that were on the Parks Department um, list and what you'll see on 
22 is where the committee landed unanimously, which was facility planning, non-local parks, legacy open space, um, and uh, planned life cycle asset replacement for non-local parks related to minor renovations would take the reductions as you see there, um, totaling a, a committee recommended reduction of 1.487 million. If there's any questions on that. Nope, you keep going, Ben. Okay, um, and then you have the list, this is related to geo bonds, where the reconciliation PDF recommended a reduction of $14.4 million. Um, again, the committee reviewed a long list of things that the Parks Department put forward, and what they were recommended unanimously was a legacy open space, a portion of Wheaton Regional Park Improvement funding, and Northwest Branch Athletic Area funding be reduced um, for a total reduction of $8.8 .8 million. Um, there are a few delays as well uh, related to the shift in funding. One is to the Northwest Branch Athletic Area, as we just mentioned, it actually moves it um, into FY29, uh, I think, so it's also a, a reduction. But Ovid Hayes and Wells, it does move um, funding from FY25 to 26. Um, we did have a long discussion about that, and, and um, Director Riley can also mention, he, he did say that he thought it was only about a three-month delay um, in actuality for that, which was helpful. Um, so that's that's before the council. So as we discussed, the Ovid Hayes and Wells, we believe that the implication here was just a matter of months. Uh, it was it was um, so, and a big section of Wheaton Regional Permits does proceed, and so we just have to phase the project, um, and hopefully there'll be time in a future you know next year's budget. Maybe we can reaccelerate some of that. We'll see how that goes. Uh, that concludes the council's review then of the committee's um, recommendations. Okay, well, I wanted to, sorry, I guess if that concludes it. There were, uh, among the things that we also worked hard to put back in was uh, the Blair Athletic Field uh, renovation. So there is a big open space there in a location that is right on the Beltway, you know, accessible to the whole county, uh, and we're working hard towards creating a high quality field that the parks would pay for and then it would be used by the school for its program but then permitted and go into our permitted portfolio and um, you know it's it's a location here is really really significant you know there's not a lot of places that are as accessible as this one and so uh, you know we felt like this was an opportunity not only to meet the regional southeast county field deficit which is profound actually and extremely difficult to do anything about because it's hard to get space for fields um, but also serving serving a potentially larger regional need because of its accessibility um, and so we have to make sure that we keep that on track and uh, we may need some uh, uh, help with Chair Rice, the blazer uh, on the dais, um, to uh, work with MCPS and um, ensure that uh, ensure that we have access and we move it forward. Everyone's enthusiastic, you know, but then it always is a matter of how you operationalize that. So uh, we've got phase one here funding, and then phase two is for a future phase. Um, was there anything else that we? I think okay. Thank you. Councilman Friedson. Yeah, I just want to quickly note uh, the South Germantown Park Cricket Field. We also retain yes. uh, yeah. funding for that, which was a really uh, important one. Uh, and Brookside Gardens uh, Master Plan additional funding to make sure that uh, that uh, stayed on schedule. So I, I will say, I think you know, when we went through this. There was a holistic approach to the entire county, mid county, up county, east county, uh, and I think you'll see that reflected in uh, the committee's work. And so I just did want to note that for. For colleagues, it's included extensively in the packet, but just make sure we highlighted that because I think the Parks Department uh, put forward and we worked together to figure out how to uh, put back funding, but make sure we we're putting back funding in a way that was equitable across uh, the county to uh, continue to move forward with uh, stated needs. And I will just highlight uh, the Council President's point earlier uh, during the mid-year discussion uh, that I was going to highlight here. Uh, about the uh, parks playing a critical role in mental health and wellness, uh, particularly for, for young people and for older 
uh, aging uh, adults uh, in our community, but really for everybody. And I think that's been uh, true always, but it's certainly been uh, even more true uh, through the pandemic with all the challenges that we face. So I just wanted to, to note that, so thanks. It's a good thing we had a reliever in our bullpen. <laughs> Thank you very much for that uh, good comment. It was important. Nailed Nobody it. got it. I don't know. Actually, it's a pretty good analogy. <laughs> That's pretty good. All right. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you. For, um, all right. for, thank you for your support for putting back this money. It's really important, and we will uh, not let you down. We'll deliver great projects. Terrific. I'm excited about the cricket field in particular. All right. Uh, no other questions or comments from colleagues. Then, without objection, we support the. Committee recommendations as amended, and we'll take the formal vote at a later time. We move on now to our colleagues in the Housing Opportunity Commission, and I'll once again turn it over to Chairman Reamer. All right, uh, and we'll welcome Naimia. Uh, we are now proceeding with housing without having Linda McMillan, and uh, we'll uh, welcome Naim. And we've got our team here from HOC. I, I think. I think the next up couple items are fairly straightforward, uh, substantially because our big conversation about housing funding really is going to happen in the context of the operating budget. We we do them both together. So, um, Naeem, I'll turn it to you, and then we'll invite our HOC team to share some comments with us, and, and then come back to the council. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the CE is recommending a total of $8.2 million for the HOC CIP. Um, it's going to two projects, one of which is a ongoing project, the supplemental funds for deeply subsidized HOC-owned units improvements um, that pays for capital renovations um, and other upgrades to existing housing stock to keep them in, in good quality. Um, so th that, that is an um, existing project. And then there's also one new project the WSSC sewer and stormline improvements at Elizabeth Square. This is essentially paying for sewer improvements at the South uh, County Aquatic Center and Elizabeth Square project uh, to increase capacity. Um, there's, it's a two-part project. One is creating a temporary uh, storm line uh, to address the housing development, and then there's a phase two of the project which will coincide with the Purple Line development, um, but when, when that is um, further along. and so. Um, staff recommendation was to approve both of those um, projects. Um, HOCCIP also includes uh, two long-standing revolving funds and a loan guarantee project. These don't have any expenditures in the six years, um, but they are kept open as the, um, the essentially as loan repayments are um, made to the county, they will get programmed in those projects as that occurs. So um, those do stay open. Um, other beyond that, um, the HOC operating budget, uh, uh, as well as the housing production fund, will be reviewed um, at the Fed committee session on April 25th. So we'll have more uh, updates at that point. HOC, would you like to share anything? Certainly don't have to, but sure. Hi there. Uh, this is uh, Tim Getzinger. I am the chief development funds officer, as well as the acting CFO. To my right is Terry Fowler, who is the budget officer for HOC, and to my left. Uh, Zachary Marks, who is the Chief Real Estate Officer. And I just want to thank you for your continued support. Uh, we are not able to do what we do at HOC without the support of Montgomery County Government or the County Council. Um, you know, I, I know that we're going to be talking about the operating budget soon, but I just want to say thank you for the continued support, uh, our efforts uh, to provide amenity rich, community connected, energy efficient, affordable housing to low and moderate income families and individuals throughout Montgomery County. Um, Council Member Friedson, you know this better than anybody else. You know there is a lack of not only affordable housing, but housing in Montgomery County. But here at HOC, we're trying to do our part. Just this past December, it's been a banner year. But I mean, if you want to just take a look at what we were able to accomplish in December, uh, we closed on a half billion dollars worth of real estate projects, over 500 affordable units, almost 300 senior uh, units that were affordable. Uh, not only that, we closed on $112 million bond issuance, as well as we closed on the first uh, issuance of the, the Housing Production Fund, which I'm sure we're gonna talk about more in the operating budget. Uh, that is just one month 
uh, out of a total of 12. Um, so we do a lot here, uh, but again, we can't do it without your help. We can't do it without your continued support of not only our operating, but our capital budgets. Uh, and yes, we really appreciate it. Thank you for that, Tim. Uh, you're a great team. I mean, I think I'd put up HOC against any housing authority in this country. I think you'll see we're doing more creative, innovative work. We're ahead of the game when it comes to federal partnerships. We are often, HOC is, is you know, proving to the rest of the country how to execute on federal affordable housing goals. And, um, you know, we're all proud of you. And I will always say, as you are here before us, HOC comes under a lot of political attack. You know, every year in Annapolis, there's efforts to curtail your authority, to undermine your undermine your authority. Um, and I think the county council needs to fight for its public housing authority. And it has a long sorted history of attacking public housing authorities. But in this county, we have a strong, effective, talented leadership team with a great organization. You know, any organization can always do things better, and we all know we work together in an iterative process, and we address issues as they arise. Uh, but we're, you know, speaking for myself, thrilled by what you're doing. Looking forward to hearing about your closing in January, because that was December's closings, and uh, I'm sure that was a year-end push. But uh, you guys are you're crushing it. And let's keep it up. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Friedson. Yeah, thanks. I, we're not going to discuss it in detail here, but it's noted in the packets. So I wanted to note it here uh, related to this conversation with the Housing Production Fund that the council put in place and that uh, HOC is, is working on. It's become a national model. Uh, it was uh, recently uh, specifically cited in a prospect article nationally for how to do mixed income uh, public uh, supported housing uh, and creative approaches. Montgomery County, Maryland was singled out nationally for, for how to do this. Uh, specifically re related to that housing production fund, and we're seeing uh, efforts uh, mimicking what we did here in Nashville and Denver and St. Petersburg and Tacoma, Washington, uh, neighbors in Washington, D.C. and Rhode Island, uh, in, in uh, uh, King County, uh, Seattle, uh, Washington, uh, and, and in California. So uh, I think there's a lot to be proud of here. We have a lot more work to do when it comes to housing, as, uh, as noted, but uh, over the last uh, several years, uh, we've done quite a lot here, and uh, folks around the country are, are taking notice and some of the things that we are doing here and, and creative approaches uh, to housing that, that we have undertaken and how to finance uh, public housing that we've undertaken here are being uh, done elsewhere. So more to come on that. I know that the Fed community is going to take it up on the 25th of this month, and we'll uh, talk about it in the context of the operating budget, but I, I thought that it uh, deserved to be uh, singled out here since uh, we're, we're talking a bit about some of the progress that we've made over the last uh, year or so. So thank you so much for your efforts to come up with that idea and to execute it as we move forward. Great. Uh, I don't see any other comments from colleagues. We have a committee recommendation, and so I think without objection, we will support that committee recommendation. Thank you very much. We now move on to Housing and Community Affairs. Once again, turn it over to Chairman Reamer. All right. Um, this one also is pretty straightforward. I don't think we recommended any changes from the executive submission. Uh, several items in here were close out, um, I think. And um, so again, the big conversation about affordable housing will come through the operating budget context when we get into uh, how we finance affordable housing as well as everything else with DHCA. There's, you know, certainly all kinds of operating budget, uh, you know, oversight we'll be conducting, but um, any. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we will cover all of that on April 25th. Um, as you know, there's also a CIP amendment for the Housing uh, Acquisition Fund as well as a new project. So all of that will be taken up on the 25th. Uh, for today, um, we will just cover this community development piece of DHCA CIP. Uh, the CE has included $4.3 million uh, for two projects, the Countywide Facade Easement Program and the Facility Planning um, uh, Project. Uh, those are both longstanding programs, um, or Countywide Facade is more recent, but these are all existing projects. Um, really no issues, I, I, you know, DHC is here to give an update on the Facade Program. Uh, if you want to 
do go ahead and do that. But otherwise, no issues from council staff's perspective on these two projects. So. Sure, uh, Mr. Nagam. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm joined by R Roger Stanley, uh, Pope in Salem, uh, Frank Demare, and Dan McHugh from DSCA. Thank you for your continued support for the for the countywide facade improvement uh, easement program and also the facility planning. As we noted, you know, in the in the package, we are trying to close out two of the projects in Burtonsville signage and also for the coastal project. Then we're also working on the Long Branch project and also uh, the Wedgwood project. Then besides these projects, we are still working with the owner along the Hillendale Shopping Center, uh, you know, regarding their project because the cost has gone up. But at the same time, you know, we are trying to work with them. You know, what the scaled down project will be, and then we are also working on a marketing piece throughout the county in terms of the county wide, you know, facade easement program. So that should be. Ongoing, my guess is late summer or early fall. Uh, so thank you very much for your continued support. We'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, not, seeing, not seeing any questions yeah. from colleagues. Oh, sorry, Councilman Navarro, my fault. Thank you, Mr. President. Just very quickly, I do want to thank uh, you and your team for their really amazing work on a facade improvement proposal for the Glenmont shopping center. Um, we worked very hard um, in uh, hoping to entice the owners to at least consider a cosmetic, uh, you know, upgrade to that uh, property and your team came up with uh, really great proposals that I think uh, would go a long way. I am forever hopeful <laughs> that maybe one day um, they will agree to this, um, but it has not been uh, easy. Um, there may be other developments, I hope, uh, in the works. I know this um, body, um, many of us here and some former council members remember how we have done almost everything in our power to set the stage for revitalization, redevelopment of that particular property, and it has been very difficult because, of course, it's a private property. However, the facade improvement was one particular uh, option that I was hoping um, that uh, would be successful, and we're still trying to figure that out. Um, there also, uh, in the past, uh, has been a facade improvement program on um, these uh, smaller uh, strip malls in um, or commercial areas in Colesville, and some of them have taken advantage of that, and it has really made a difference. And so. I just really want to thank your team because they are absolutely wonderful in uh, collaborating and uh, in coming up with scenarios and options uh, that does make a difference uh, for sure. And, and again, we'll keep our fingers crossed and see what we can do at Lemon Shopping Center. Thank you very much, Councilman Navarro, for your leadership and your support. We have not given up on Glenmont Shopping Center. We'll keep on working on it, and I'm sure one day we'll, we'll get there. Yes. So thank you for your support. Thank you. May I may I just say a couple of words? I, I do want to thank you to Council Member Navarro. We we work very hard to get get the owners excited about the Glenmont Shopping Center, and I don't think she mentioned, but there are about eleven different owners there. They all have easements that go across the parking lot, so it's a very difficult project to get everybody to buy in on. So we didn't get one hundred percent participation. Maybe only about ten percent. Uh, but we're going to keep working on that. I also want to mention that we are closing out the um, Burtonsville project and as, as well as the Colesville project. And I just want to mention to Councilman Hucker, if he's still uh, on, on the screen, that we are going to be installing two Burtonsville, welcome to Burtonsville signs at his request. We work with his, he and his staff, and there'll be two signs installed on the Route 198. <clears throat> Westbound and then eastbound, and they should probably happen in about the next two months. So you'll see two new signs there, and we're working to uh, do a marketing plan for the new county facade easement program, and we're also working to provide some facade guidelines that will help the uh, owners understand what they can possibly do to improve their property. So. 
thank you very much for your input thank and you. and the funding that you 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 got to make it happen. Thank well, you. thank you. I, I again appreciate that. And fun fact, I mean uh, uh, that facade improvement also project uh, mm -hmm. in Burtonsville where we have a strip of uh, restaurants. Right. It's actually initiated when I was representing that. Um, district way back in the day and so I only share that because it does take a lot of patience sometimes yes. <laughs> to get some of these things done but but you have a, an incredible team and and again um, it's it's sometimes very you know it's, it's never easy uh, right. when you have complex issues about ownership and things of that nature right. but your team is always there to to figure out you know ways to 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 approach it, so yeah, maybe you. we'll get there soon hopefully yeah, the, the Burdensville project we we actually the county put in about two two million dollars there, and the owners put in about two point five million. So it made a big difference. It made a difference. Um, and Cybels also participated yes. in a couple other properties, as well as Mr. Katz. So you can see a big improvement. We also, in the Colesville area, we work with the Seven Eleven property at the mm -hmm. corner of Randolph Road and New Tiger. Hampshire. Yeah. Yep. And so you can pass through there at night, and you see the children doing karate yes. in the windows. So it's, it's very nice. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Councilman Marino? Uh, yes, I wish we had a photo of the facade easement program, but major shout out for uh, Councilmember Navarro and others who made that happen because it is a huge improvement. I think you can, you know, very visible. Uh, I think it feels like a community now much more that, um, you know, is it, it, it was blighted. I think it was blighted. And now, it feels the same as as many other retail centers around the county, and uh, we're we're grateful to see that. So thank you. All right. So we've got a committee recommendation. Uh, any other questions or thoughts from colleagues? No. Nope. Uh, so without objection, we will support this in a straw vote as well. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, next is the Revenue Authority. Once again, back over to Chairman Reamer. All right. I think uh, Keith Miller could have played 18 holes between when he arrived here and when he gets to, to the dais. Played, he could play 18 with Craig because it's all par. There's no, there's, no one's looking for a ball anywhere. It's all birdie. It's all birdie. It's all, birdie. all right. Um, welcome. Welcome to uh, the team from the Revenue Authority. And Naeem, again, is our staff lead. Uh, I'll just say the headline here, the major uh, piece is we are looking for an increase of funding. Well, they are, and the executive has recommended an increase of funding for the Crush facility, which is a very interesting, uh, exciting new initiative to create a uh, you know a, a facility that provides equipment for making wine, and it's very expensive equipment. So if you want to start a winery, you have a huge capital expense, millions of dollars worth of equipment to figure out how to get. Well, if we provide that, we can actually be a place that winemakers will come and use the facility. They'll pay for it. And then hopefully it'll be part of a, a renaissance of winemaking that is happening in Montgomery County. And as, as we all know, or should know, there is great land in Montgomery County for, for growing grapes. And the hills of, of Clarksburg are actually among the finest in the mid-Atlantic. And for many reasons, perhaps some having to do with zoning, uh, wine wineries have not really wanted to invest in the county uh, until very recently. And now some very remarkable wineries, uh, including Black Ankle, Old Westminster, have bought very large properties in Montgomery County. And we're looking forward to celebrating their, um, you know, th their vintages. So. This facility is going to be, it's, it's novel, and it shows what you can do when you have a revenue authority that has a unique mandate to uh, support the county and also do so in ways that are revenue uh, revenue generating. And um, I know Keith has been working on this. I think I probably heard about this when I first arrived at the council, to be quite honest. It's been under development for a very long time, and uh, certainly appreciate the county executive's recommendation here. And uh, I know there's been state legislators that have helped fund this, so it's just been a big team effort. And when we're we're all invited to the uh, ribbon cutting pretty soon, right? You want to tell us about that, Keith? Well, thank you very much. Um, it's it's yeah, this project. I think it's when we look back, I think it's about eight or nine years ago. Yeah, it's it's been a while, and uh, we appreciate all the support all along in this project, and we're really excited about it. So the groundbreaking. 
Um, we have uh, we started uh, originally scheduled the groundbreaking back in January, but decided with everything going on to delay it. Um, so the project is under construction. We are moving forward uh, at this point, and we look forward to seeing everybody out there at the uh, end of the month uh, for the groundbreaking. And to your point, you know the the, the crush is one part part of this project, um, and that we're really excited about. Um, you know the. Uh, the, the two barriers to entry there are the equipment, as you said, uh, and then also the cost of vines. And so, you know, we're eliminating one of those barriers to entry. Um, to your point as well, there's a lot of great wineries that are, are coming and growing grapes out there in in, um, in Clarksburg and in the uh, in the Ag Reserve. We're hoping that this project will now enable farmers to maybe take one or two acres um, that are on a hillside, usually not used for crops, um, and and go ahead and be able to utilize the equipment here and expand the wine um, production in the county, which then leads to ag tourism. And that's really where we want this to be, the gateway to ag tourism uh, in the ag reserve. And um, so we're really, really excited about this project and appreciate all the support. Naeem. Um, yes, overall, the CE is recommending um, 17.3 million in a six year period for the Revenue Authority. Um, this is actually 1.9 million less than the previously approved CIP, and it's mostly due to uh, expenditures for the Crossvines project moving out of the CIP. Um, but as we know, as you noted, there's some funding for the Crossvines project in FY23. Um, overall, uh, the number of projects is actually increasing from 3 to 12, and I'll get into those in a minute. Um, the key takeaway overall from a mass, uh, fiscal perspective is that the Revenue Authority projects are funded through Revenue Authority bonds or um, through available fund balance um, from revenues that come in. Um, the air park, um, more specifically, can be funded through state or federal grants uh, for specific projects. Um, so essentially, Revenue Authority CIP doesn't really impact the rest of the CIP, given that it's um, specialized revenue sources. Um, I'll go over the new projects first, and those can be divided into essentially golf course-related projects. There's a number of um, uh, relatively small, uh, low-cost projects, um, essentially replacing um, golf cart pathways, um, parking lots, uh, irrigation systems. Um, really, there's no significant issues with those. Those are simply planned replacements um, to address, to maintain a high-quality golf courses. Um, so these are at Falls Road Golf Course, Little Bennett, um, let's see here, Northwest Golf Course, Poolsville, as well as uh, Rattlewood. Um, there's also a office relocation project that's essentially uh, building out office space at the Rattlewood Golf Course. Um, this would allow um, Revenue Authority staff in the EOB who are, who are currently leasing space in the EOB to move to Rattlewood so that all their staff is located in one location. Um, so that's planned in FY23. And then, uh, let's see here. there are remaining projects, remaining new projects for the Revenue Authority are at the air park. There is a runway lighting project. Um, it's actually a second phase. Um, that would replace, this is, it's the second of two phases that would replace the existing lighting with LED lighting um, to address, um, essentially these are, this update, upgrade is mandated by the FAA um, as part of the, um, an airport layout plan that was uh, conducted 20 years ago. So it's gotten to the point where the lights are going to be replaced. Um, the other three projects at the airport are, are related to a road relocation project. Essentially, the main issue here is that you have an existing road servicing um, three private properties, one of which is a tire um, retail store. And when there's a tractor trailer delivering tires to that store, it presents a, a safety obstruction for aircraft taking off from the nearby um, runway. And so the, um, this project is a little complicated. Essentially, it depends on FAA approval of the design of the road. And that would mean that either at least one property, the tire property, tire store property would have to be purchased and demolished. Um, and there's a second property um, that may also need to be purchased, but it depends on the design of the road once that is complete and approved, by, reviewed and approved by the FAA. Um, so there's some significant funding uh, for those projects. Most of it is um, federal or state grants that would cover the cost of those. Um, but essentially, Keith, if you want to explain any more of that very high level description. Yeah. So <laughs> no, I think you did a great job in, in capturing it. This is part of the AOP. It's it's been a project um, that we've been working on. Our goal here is really not to buy businesses and relocate businesses. That's really what we've done. And so 
In my tenure here in the last 15 years, we've worked with the FAA on several studies to try and avoid um, doing this, and we've gotten to a point now where we, we do have to purchase one property, but hopefully working with the FAA on a relocation of this road, we can avoid purchasing the second. And that's our, um, so the modification to the CIP was to reduce the, the second land purchase out uh, to a later year, and hopefully we, we move forward with the uh, road, location, road relocation. So that's kind of the plan. Uh, great. Uh, Councilmember Rice, and then I had a couple questions. Councilmember Rice. Just, just, just very quickly, I really want to thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Miller, for uh, continuing to think about ways we can enhance safety at the air park, uh, understanding that with lighting, with some of the things regarding pathways, it just enhances safety for the air park in general and the greater community, and so that's always a big deal. So really wanted to say thank you for that. Um, when it comes to golf courses, and I've played all of them, uh, it, it certainly is one in which I didn't say well. Um, it, 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 it certainly is one that um, uh, always continued investment uh, matters so much. And I know that these are highly utilized amenities, as we were talking before, about so many of our assets that contribute to the quality of life here in Montgomery County. And I know it means a big deal especially as we're about to uh, encroach upon the Masters where Tiger is playing. Uh, it's going to be very exciting for us. And so uh, from that standpoint, golf continues to be uh, a leading driver in terms of recreational activities here in this county. And so really appreciate uh, you continuing to invest in those, as well as the Poolsville uh, crushing facility, although that's not in my district anymore. It used to be, um, but certainly pass that off. When, uh, when it was first being discussed, I'll never forget uh, sitting there as you laid out a vision for me as we sat there on the whole and you said this is what i see and to now see that coming to fruition just talks about your innovative leadership and really um why you're a great leader of our revenue authority continuing to figure out ways not only can we meet the need of being economically competitive but also again contributing to the overall well-being and quality of life of montgomery county so thanks so much for the great work um, Mr. Miller, welcome. Thanks for being here. Just uh, I do want to thank you for the two recent public community sessions you had regarding the air park and uh, just give you a platform right now quickly to talk about. I know that uh, you're working on ensuring that there's more community engagement moving forward. If you could just speak briefly about that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the two meetings last year were very important as far as, you know, the first meeting back in June was a, an opportunity to hear directly from the FAA. Um, as we all know, the FAA has a lot of control over what happens at the airport, though it is our responsibility, to your point, to work with the community. So that communication, that dialogue is the responsibility of us. Um, we do have a full-time manager at the airport now um, who is leading in those discussions and being responsive to the community. We are planning more meetings again this year um, to, uh, again, we have to continue to try and find ways that we can work with the community. Um, and I think there's been a lot of change, um, even in the last year, in us really paying attention there. Um, so we're going to continue to do that. We're going to set up uh, regularly, uh, a kind of a regular schedule of, of activity with the community to keep that dialogue going. Um, we were just, as a matter of fact, I was just on the phone this morning with the FAA, Washington Area District Office. We were talking about some other things and, and how can we be innovative uh, and trying some solutions. So we will continue to do that, and we will continue that dialogue. It's very important to all of us and to the community around it. Um, the one last thing I will just mention uh, that's not in the CIP and um, something that we're all working on, there are a couple um, through the federal infrastructure bill uh, that came out. There is um, some funding that is available potentially for the airport, and so we're working with the FAA right now to see how we can maybe utilize some of that funding as well. Um, but it's too early to be in the CIP. Um, something that is, is probably a year or two away. Um, so we'll continue to work with the community uh, and work with the FAA to find solutions. Thank you. And then just uh, to reiterate Councilmember Rice's point, golf has exploded. Uh, it was one of the few sports that people could play during the pandemic, and it has resurrected a level of interest that, you know, we're seeing sort of across the country, which presents some really unique opportunities from an economic development standpoint um, that I think we should be more intentional about connecting and acknowledging what a great asset our public golf courses are and with the additional revenue coming in i know you're making some additional investments in those courses to enhance their play even more than they already have been but i do think that it's a story we need to tell and connect more definitively 
as we're trying to attract and retain businesses here because it's uh, an important component. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, uh, so we've got a committee recommendation. Colleagues, no other questions or comments? Then without objection, I believe we support the committee recommendations as well. Thank you. All right, uh, last one for Council Member Reamer uh, is our wonderful Recreation Department. Council Member Reamer. All right. Vivian is here. Thank you, Vivian. And we're joined by Director Riley, Ms. Clutter, Ms. S. Saucy, thank you. And Ms. Jackson. All right. Um, well, I think I'm just going to pass it to you, Vivian. Why don't you take us in? Thank you. Uh, sure. Um, so for the fiscal year 23 to 28 capital improvements program for the department, recreation department, the executive is recommending total of 97.4 million, which is a decrease of 41.1 million, or 29.7% from the amended fiscal year 21 to 26 CIP. The decrease is primarily due to substantial completion of the South County Regional Recreation and Aquatic Center. Um, the joint, uh, sorry, the Fed Committee reviewed seven of the 10 recreation CIP projects on March 2nd. And for six of those, the Fed Committee recommended approval three to zero um, of the projects as recommended by the executive. The first one is South County Regional Recreation and Aquatic Center. There is no cost change from the approved 21 to 26 project, and the facility is expected to be completed during fiscal year 23. The executive has recommended operating budget funding to open the facility. Um, the second project is the Martin Luther King Jr. Swim Center renovation project. Um, there is no cost change from the, from the approved fiscal year 21 to 26 project. The work remaining in the project involves replacement of the underground drainage system and pool deck, and that will require the facility to be closed for approximately six to eight months. DGS and Recreation are still coordinating the schedule for, uh, for taking the facility offline in order to minimize the community impact. Um, the third project is a new project, Holiday Park Net Zero Initiative, uh, which is a program's 3.079 million in the CIP. It's for the design and construction of energy efficiency net zero improvements at the Holiday Park Senior Center. Um, it will include building facade uh, improvements as well as window replacement and a new building exterior. The fourth project is the Kennedy Shriver Aquatic Center Building Envelope Improvement Project. This is a continuing project. The, there is an increase in the project of 4.355 million from the fiscal year 21 to 26 CIP, and that is uh, primarily attributable to energy efficiency targeted to achieve net zero. Um, the department reports that it is tentatively planning to take KSOC offline in fiscal year 25. The fifth project is swimming pool slide replacement project. It's a level of effort project that provides a process for the department to repair and replace sides, slides for safe operation. Um, the project, the Pair and replacement begin in fiscal year 23 and continue through fiscal year 30. Um, there is a revised project description uh, form in your in your packet at circles 32 to 33, and it just provides more Im information about the project schedule that was presented to the Fed committee on the second. And the last project that the joint, uh, sorry, that the Fed committee. Uh, recommended approval of the executive's pro, uh, recommendation is the wall park garage and park improvements uh, project. It relocates surface parking for the wall park and the Kennedy Shriver Aquatic Center to adjacent property. There is no cost change from the approved fiscal year 21 to 26 project, and the schedule has been adjusted to reflect anticipated developer delays. Um, there is one project, the Recreation Facility Refurbishment Level, uh, level of Effort Project, 
which the committee recommended approval of, but requested additional language in the PDF that reflected the scheduling of the specific projects in the PDF, as well as a breakout of the uh, costs between planning and design and construction. So an updated PDF is attached in your packet at Circles 33. There is an increase of 13.217 million uh, in that project from the fiscal year 21 to 26 uh, approved project, and uh, funding was shifted from the Recreation Facility Modernization Project, which the, was closed out, and, and that funding was then put into this refurbishment project. That's about it. All right, thank you. Back to you, Mr. Council President. A lot of, uh, a lot of investment in our aquatic programs here. Uh, it's really, you know, m most of this is swimming related. So no wonder we got Clady Ledecky in Montgomery County. <laughs> Director Riley's here, perhaps you'll want to hear Director from Riley? Yeah, a lot of our facilities are, are very old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, yeah, we, we do need to modernize them and um, kind of step up the game, uh, not only for Katie Ledecky, but for young, young kids who need to learn to swim and seniors who need access to warm water and, and fitness classes. So it's long overdue. Uh, the infrastructure of KSAC and Martin Luther King and others are, are really in critical need. So we're looking forward to moving these forward. That's terrific. Uh, what's the um, target date for the ribbon cutting for South County? Do we know yet? Uh, I don't think we know quite yet. I mean, I think Mr. we're talking. Dice is coming Mr. on down. Dice is running. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Dice is running forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're thinking don't, don't, don't late spring, yeah. early summer. Yeah. Yeah. Hiring is a little challenging. We managed right to now. be sitting in the audience all day today in the very last item. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the facility is currently scheduled to be completed early in 23, early 23. A specific date is not yet determined, but the construction of the KSAC or the uh, SCRAC facility itself uh, is currently slated for January, February 23. But we'll have to coordinate that with uh, uh, all the rest of the work being done in that area before an actual ribbon cutting, because the, the aquatic facility will be done before all of the final construction on the housing towers are completed. Right. That'll be a godsend when um, Kennedy Shriver goes down for that year. Well, we, work just specifically, yes. we work specifically <laughs> with REC to make yeah. sure that one is done before the other yeah. closes. Yeah. Same with Martin Luther King, the death yeah. work right. as well. I mean, it's, it's our relief valve. So sort Good. of a ballet. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, great. Um, I don't see any questions or other comments. Oh, Council Vice President Glass. I'll be real quick. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, since we are talking about recreation infrastructure, uh, just curious if you can give us a status update on the renovations that are necessary at the Long Branch Rec Center and the Caulfield Rec Center. The uh, renovations are currently underway. Uh, let me correct me. I don't want to use the term renovations. We're not renovating. We are. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, we are. Uh, if you will, restoring to what they were before Restoring, yes. Before they were taken offline to become shelters temporarily, temporarily. Uh, they, so we are restoring them, which is basically uh, finishes, paint, wallpaper, repairing some damages, some fixtures. Recreation is bringing in some uh, new equipment. And the, uh, the, the real time-consuming element is the floors and gym floors and the in those areas. But that work is underway uh, at both facilities as we speak and is probably about another month or six weeks away. Yeah. From I mean, thanks to David's team, they've done a remarkable job in painting the entire gym at Long Branch. Thank you, David. Um, and we have sanded at least the first level for the gym floor. We've got furniture on order, some in stock. Um, so yeah, we're looking somewhere around May 16th as a soft launch, uh, and then um, Caulfield will follow that because it's the same painters and the same right, same group, same contractors. We we did anticipate this, uh, so we worked with Rec to pre-order some of the replacement equipment because as we've all heard with uh, supply chain issues, the long delays on some items. So we, we pre-purchased and have stored in order to make sure that when we're ready, there are no last minute surprises. 
thank you for that update. I know the communities will really appreciate it. And while the last two years were unprecedented in so many different ways, uh, I know we all are going to be excited about returning these rec centers to their community. So thank you. Great. Uh, so I don't see any other questions or comments from colleagues. And without objection, we support the staff recommendations and the committee's work on this. Uh, thank you all very much. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Good thank seeing you. everybody. All right, that moves us on to the final item on the agenda today, just a small one, uh, Montgomery County Public Schools. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to the uh, Chair of our Education and Culture Committee, Councilmember Rice. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And yeah, what's a couple billion dollars between friends? Um, you know, uh, as, as Dr. McKnight, uh, and Dr. McKnight, this is the first time you are in person as the superintendent of Montgomery County Public Schools, so welcome to you. Um, but uh, did just want to highlight that um, as the General Assembly is closing out its session, I certainly want to thank uh, our General Assembly and especially our delegation who has continued to fight uh, for additional capital funding for our schools, which is tremendous. Um, we have been woefully short for decades, and that has put us behind the eight ball when it comes to really meeting the needs of our students. Uh, we started off this morning talking with Montgomery College and talking about that the building should reflect the great things that are happening inside those walls. And the reality is, is that in many of our schools, unfortunately, that is not the case. And it's of no fault of our own. We try and do what we can um, in trying to keep those buildings at the levels in which we know are commensurate with the education taking place in those buildings. Um, but unfortunately, we just haven't had the revenue. And so it's great to see that an infusion of cash that is akin to uh, what it is that we are seeing that is happening, the support that our teachers and administrators and support staff are all giving to our students to make sure that our kids receive a high quality education. And so with that, um, we do have a Board of Education proposed uh, CIP that totaled uh, $1.77 billion. Uh, it's a little over a hundred and forty eight million than uh, uh, the current approved CIP. But at this point, I do want to give an opportunity for uh, the superintendent uh, to discuss a little bit about the project and also our uh, vice uh, president of the Board of Education, Carlos Silvestri, who's here as well, um, because they've always been great partners in working with us, understanding that we try and do what we can with what we have. Uh, but unfortunately, I understand that there are instances in which we can't fund everything that we know are all great projects uh, in delivering for our kids. So I'll turn it over to the school system for any opening remarks before we go into details about uh, the budget. Dr. McKnight, uh, Ms. Silvestri. Good afternoon, President Albornoz and members of the council. Thank you for the opportunity to review the Board of Education's requested fiscal year 23-28 capital improvements program. The Board of Education is committed to working with Montgomery County elected officials to address the many facility needs of our school system. And we cannot lose sight of our core mission and must provide our students with the best possible learning environment. And I know that you are true partners in that core mission. The board believes, as representatives of our staff, students, and pardon, par, parent guardian community, that it is our responsibility to request a capital improvements program that reflects the essential funding to meet our needs. With that said, I do understand the county's fiscal constraints and the desire to implement budget reduction measures. However, I must stress the importance of the Board of Education's request. We believe this request was fiscally responsible and aligns with our priorities. And while you consider possible reductions today, I believe it is important to point out several critical capital improvement needs. The requested CIP includes two new cap capacity projects at Burtonsville and Greencastle Elementary Schools, along with new countywide infrastructure and sustainability initiatives. It, is also, it also includes important projects such as early childhood centers, emergency replacement of major building components, and the relocation of the material management building. It is also important to point out that the majority of the increases included in this requested CIP are due to inflation 
for previously approved capital projects, as well as additional prevailing wage costs to maximize the use of state school construction funds, specifically funds through the Build to Learn Act program. Therefore, the Board of Education's FY23 capital budget and FY23-28 capital improvements program totals $1.67 billion, an increase of $148.3 million more than the previously approved CIP. Several of the countywide projects that are included in our request also have operating budget implications due to funding associated with the blueprint for Maryland's future. For example, critical early childhood center infrastructure for current and growing programming at Watkins Mill High School and in the eastern part of the county. The board's request includes additional funding for systemic projects such as roof replacement and planned life cycle asset replacement as well as substantial increase to the much needed heated heating, ventilation and air conditioning replacement project to address backlog of upgrades and or replacements of HVAC systems that are beyond their expected life of service. Our FY23 state aid request is a combination of projects for both the annual state allocation as well as the Built to Learn Act funds. We will continue to work with staff at both the county and state levels to maximize state funding for both of these resources. We look forward to working with you as you review this CIP request. Thank you for the opportunity to make these remarks. And now I pass it on to Dr. McKnight. Thank you so much, Ms. Silvestri. Good afternoon, Council President Albanos, Education and Culture Committee Chair, Councilman Rice, and all county council members. It is indeed nice to see you all in person and to be able to present to you uh, today our requested FY23 capital budget and the FY23-28 capital improvements program. So I'll begin this presentation by saying, after COVID-19, facilities, schools have always, uh, they've existed, but they exist in a way that really focus on our core mission right now of bringing our community together. Every school that a student walks into, a parent walks into to drop off their child for the day represents a sense of pride around what this space uh, represents for them and all the great things that we have planned for them inside of that school building. And I think the same exists for all of our facilities, for staff. Um, staff have been impacted over the past couple of years and so as they come into spaces together, we want them to be together in spaces in which they take much pride in um, and, and have all the things there available to them for them to embrace great working conditions moving forward. And so as I bring forward our discussion today around capital budget, I just say that it fits within the theme of what our focus is and will continue to be as a school system for the years to come. Montgomery County has seen steady enrollment for our students uh, through, two, I would say, 20, uh, 2007, 2008. We constantly have seen enrollment in our school system since then. When we were all impacted by the pandemic in March of 20, things started to change um, and that was no surprise to anyone. As of our enrollment count that we report to the state, which is September 30th every year, this year, September 30th, 2021, we sent in an enrollment count of 158,232 students. That is a year's decline in student enrollment, not as, not as significant as it was in the 2019-20 school year, but significant enough to be noted. I think most importantly, what we have to always do is plan for what is to come. There's no doubt in my mind that for the reasons that I opened up in terms of the sense of pride that we will continue to instill in our school buildings and spaces, that our families and students are gonna return and they're gonna return in large numbers. Our total school enrollment projected is to increase up to 166, over 166,000 students by the 27-28 school year. It's imperative upon us to be able to plan now for exactly what that will need to be and what it looks like. Therefore, we believe the capacity projects included in the adopted CIP are still warranted and must remain on their approved schedules. As a result of the pandemic, again, something that didn't change for our school system that impacted many were things that we'd anticipate, labor shortages, which impacted project, projects, um, material prices, roads uh, in ways that were really significant as well as disruptions to the supply chain. All of those pieces have to be taken into consideration when we looked at our time schedule of projects and the amount that we originally requested for many of our funding opportunities were changed as a result of this. Um, and so due to these extraordinary circumstances, there were funding shortfalls in many of our capital projects between budgeted costs 
and the actual planned expenditures in the adopted CIP. Therefore, increases in the total project costs were required to provide construction funds necessary to maintain the previously approved completion dates. So on February 7th, a letter from Council Member Rice, Chair of Education and Culture Committee was received by MCPS requesting a non-recommended reduction scenario that would align with the county executive's recommendation. And so on February 22nd, we did send a response back to Council President Albernose outlining the following non-recommended reduction scenarios. We recommended that we extend the construction schedule by one year for the new Crown High School, the reopening of Woodward High School and Northwood High School. Delay the completion dates by one year for Silver Spring International, Wooten and Magruder High Schools. Delay the completion dates by two years for Burtonsville and Highland View Elementary Schools. Reduce expenditures for five of our countywide systemic projects, including heating, ventilation, and air conditioning replacement and planned life cycle asset replacement. Remove all expenditures from the material management building relocation. We ask that the County Council explore all possible alternatives that would, bring, that would maintain the expenditure schedules included in the board's requested TIP. I also want to say that engagement in our school community on behalf of the school system continues to be important. And so for everything that you've seen in our CIP and recommendations, we have and will continue to engage in a very personable way with our different communities so that they understand exactly what circumstances we're working under. And most importantly, we take their input into the process of deciding what to do next. So we look forward to working with you to ensure that the many capital projects included in our request to address capacity and programmatic needs, as well as aging infrastructure are funded. Thank you, I'm here with the staff today to engage in discussions for follow-up uh, conversation or questions that you may have, but I'll turn it back to you, Councilman Rice. Well, thank you very much, Dr. McKnight, and thank you very much, Vice President Silvestri. Um, I really wanted to uh, uh, talk about your staff who's done an amazing job working with our staff, so I really want to say uh, that I appreciate Mr. Adams, uh, Dr. Dawson, uh, working with Ms. McGuire and Mr. Levchenko, uh, who uh, continue to try and figure out ways to make this work. Uh, understanding that it requires so much time for us to invest in uh, trying to, you know, adjust the pieces. And I want to thank Ms. Beck uh, and Ms. Uh, Jawa from uh, OMB who continue to work uh, with us as well. Um, you know, we've pulled off some amazing feats before. Uh, and I always say that each year presents its own unique challenges, and this is one in which we find ourselves in the same boat. This year, more understanding, as you said, Dr. McKnight, about the issues regarding uh, the affordability um, that has risen exponentially amongst projects, and unfortunately, Mr. Dice left, but uh, he could tell you all too well about every single county project that we have that has grown exponentially in terms of uh, cost, um, and then just availability alone, right? So some of the things we just can't even get. Uh, and so it, it really does have huge impacts. And um, it's hopeful that uh, I had mentioned before about the General Assembly, but I know that uh, Dele Delegate uh, Mac Maggie McIntosh, uh, her bill passed on Friday. We're still trying to understand what that means for us. Um, unfortunately, I don't think it's going to be as large of an impact as we would have hoped it would have been in terms of our bottom line, but every little bit helps right? Uh, and any more flexibility that's afforded to us can hopefully get us back to closer with some of those particular projects. Um, your um, focus on making sure that these kinds of items happen is not lost on us. Uh, we understand what these impacts are. We know these schools. We know the kids that are in these schools. And that's incredibly important also to make sure that folks understand why these are priority projects. It's Councilmember Navarro and I and Councilmember Reamer who've been here the longest who've seen the iteration of that list change in terms of how we identified which projects we would bring forward because we knew about who the people were who were being impacted by these projects, right? Working in conjunction with the Board of Education and with school leadership. And so um, we get it and understand. And we're going to do everything within our power to try and get back as many of those items that we know 
are going to be incredibly important to our overall community. So I just want to thank you uh, for your advocacy. I know, unfortunately, Dr. McKnight, that you have to leave uh, for another meeting. So I, I wanted to make sure that you heard that before you left uh, to understand that we are committed to continuing to work with you until the very end of our budget cycle to see what we can try and reaccelerate. Um, so with that, I wanted to turn it over to Ms. McGuire. Uh, and Mr. Levchenko, Mr. Levchenko, this is the first public opportunity I've gotten to see you, so please, I want to extend my deepest sympathies to you and your family uh, for the loss of your father and um, for you to be here today before us. Uh, just again, it's just um, amazing. It talks about your dedication uh, to this job and what it is that you continue to do in supporting us, so thank you for that, sir. Uh, so let me turn it over to Ms. McGuire and to Mr. Levchenko. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Chair Rice, and I will just um, briefly uh, elaborate on some of the affordability markers that were highlighted in the overviews that have been presented. Um, and I do just want to echo that certainly MCPS staff, OMB staff, and council staff, um, we, we have to work together very closely to track all of the moving parts through here and just appreciate the um, intense work and intense collaboration that we all share together for that. Um, as was presented, the Board of Education's uh, requested budget uh, was a significant increase of 140 8.3 million over the current approved um, and then again as, as as has been mentioned state aid has played a very important variable throughout um, this budget process um, in addition to the um, cost increases uh, that were highlighted due to construction increases and other um, pressures in the board's budget um, also was the need to account for some of the steps that the county needs to take to draw down that additional state aid and to really be able to leverage as much data as possible for projects and to um, be able to take advantage of the built to learn funding that uh, is in place. And so with that in mind, the county executive's recommendation uh, both cuts and adds. Uh, and we're sort of in an odd situation with this one in that it does require uh, reductions from the MCPS um, uh, from the board's requested budget. At the same time, though, it does come off in the whole as a higher amount because uh, the executive did make room um, f to add in the prevailing wage dollars and the um, match that would be needed to, again, leverage those built to learn dollars and be sure that we could maximize state funding. Um, so that is sort of that additional layer that you see in the executive's recommended budget. Um, as Dr. McKnight indicated, uh, the chair and president did request and the ed committee did request that the school system, um, as, as we do each year, ask for their assistance in identifying how um, the board's budget could be brought into affordability alignment with the executive's request a re recommendation. Of course, that is the affordability starting point for the council. And so as a result, MCPS did, um, again, participate with us in that and provide the non-recommended scenario that was um, outlined earlier. I do want to emphasize that that scenario does not change the Board of Education's request. The board's budget continues to be the board's budget. It is merely an illustrative ex exercise that the schools um, do participate with us so that we can, again, reach a collaborative uh, outcome together. With that in mind, um, so the, the Education and Culture Committee did, uh, of course, meet to go through all of this range of affordability markers, also met to go through the um, projects and uh, both the, the capacity and individual projects, the systemic projects and level of effort projects that do comprise the Board of Education's um, uh, requested budget for MCPS. And so with that, I will just highlight briefly the Education and Culture Committee's recommendation. Um, the committee did acknowledge that, of course, the committee would support uh, in concept the full request of the Board of Education. However, the non-recommended reduction scenario is the appropriate starting point for reconciliation to meet affordability guidelines. And so with that in mind, the committee uh, did unanimously recommend to accept the technical adjustments that are included uh, in that uh, non-recommended scenario in the executive's budget accept the Woodward uh, reopening one-year construction extension due to production delays. Given that deferral, uh, also accept the one-year extension in completion of the Northwood facility because those projects are so closely linked together sequentially. Accept the cost increases reflected for the Wooten High School and Magruder High School major capital projects. Preliminarily accept, pending reconciliation, the expenditure change to the Poolsville High School major capital project and that expenditure change will add the anticipated phase two scope of work and preliminarily accept other project delays assumed 
again, pending reconciliation of the full CIP. And so with that, uh, again, we, we, the committee does put forward the non-recommended scenario as the starting point for the reconciliation process. At the same time, the committee did uh, prioritize the, the um, order in which the committee would um, recommend that projects be restored uh, if other revenues uh, are identified through the CIP reconciliation process. And in terms of prioritization for restoration, the committee recommends that first uh, we would, the council would restore some or all of the requested increases, particularly to the ADA compliance, HVAC replacement, and PLAR projects. Those are systemic projects that, of course, address those systemic needs across uh, all of the schools in the district and are very key systemic projects for the school system. Second, consider moving up the completion dates for the Burtonsville Elementary School Edition and the Highland View Elementary School Edition projects. Those projects would be in the CIP, again, potentially uh, deferred under the non-recommended scenario. The, the committee would recommend uh, moving those up to the extent possible. And then third, consider possible restorations in the remaining projects. Just two other quick highlights. Um, again, state aid has been very much discussed, and as uh, Mr. Rice was saying, we will, of course, continue to work together to take advantage of all of the changes uh, uh, at the state level as we approach Sinodai and beyond. And also, uh, the committee did want to highlight that, um, again, even though this obviously budget continues to present challenges, as we have discussed, it's a strong CIP, um, and even if all of these non-recommended reductions were accepted, um, the, the CIP would still provide for the inclusion of several new projects, increases in systemics across the board, and additional expenditures. And so again, just wanting to recognize that in part because of the strength of the state aid um, that has been provided through Built to Learn, um, and through the county um, being able to match and leverage those funds really does uh, result in a robust CIP. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. McGuire. And let me just close by saying this, that my colleagues and I have uh, certainly reflected on the fact that although it's not everything we wanted, it's more than what we had before. And that is something that is incredibly important while we know, you know, we asked for that uh, large Christmas list because we deserve it. We've been good, um, but unfortunately, you know, um, you know, there there comes a time when we are we celebrate what it is that we're able to achieve, and we commit to continuing to uh, continue to build off of that. So, um, with that, uh, Mr. President, I turn it over to you. I know some of my colleagues may have comments, uh, questions, but um, that is the recommendation of the Education and Culture Committee. Thank you very much, Chairman Rice, and I want to associate myself with the comments regarding Mr. Levchenko and his family. Um, it's good to see you back, sir. And we are a family here on the County Council, and so we, we really appreciate you being here today. All right, uh, I've got um, a bunch of colleagues that would like to speak. Uh, in the order of the queue here, I've got Councilmember Hucker, followed by Councilmember Friedson, then Council Vice President Glass, and then Councilmember Jawando. Councilmember Hucker, turning in, tuning in virtually. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And. Um, Keith, yeah, uh, please accept my condolences to you and Phil and your whole family uh, on your loss as well. Um, and thank you for being back here in such short notice. Um, I'm really grateful, um, everyone, for the, the continued close collaboration of both the county and the MCPS staff to um, position the county well to track state aid for um, the CIP projects, especially um, while we're looking at a, what's been a very much moving target um, in response to state legislation. I'm really grateful to my former uh, great chair and and uh, friend Maggie McIntosh for that bill to bring project eligibility more in line with the mission of Kerwin. Um, I'm wondering, um, uh, maybe Ms. McGuire, if you could talk about, or anybody else, what will its passage really mean for uh, schools like Eastern Middle School and Piney Branch and Twinbrook, which don't have construction funds in the budget at this point? So I'll just comment briefly and then I may turn to Mr. Adams for additional spe uh, specifics on those projects. Um, one of the, um, in, in, in broad strokes, the, the significant benefit of that bill is some additional flexibility when it comes to um, county projects being eligible for state funding. Of course, we're familiar with the um, various requirements of the IAC and other avenues for having um, projects approved for state aid. This bill really does um, uh, loosen up some of the um, guidelines and parameters so that the so that the state aid uh, requirements can be more inclusive and we would have more eligibility for projects um, under that scenario. And so, um, so we do anticipate being able to, again, draw down more state aid um, uh, under some of the guidelines that would be approved in that bill. 
Um, Mr. Adams, did you want to speak to those projects specifically? Sure, sure. and that's a, a great question, one that, you know, I think uh, we, we've renamed this the McIntosh Bill because it is so powerful in terms of the, the, uh, the support, additional state aid that can come our way. And the schools that you mentioned actually are prime examples of positives that come out of that, that bill. Um, there's, there's components that are tied to poverty and farms. Um, there's also components tied to adjacencies and a little more flexibility than what we've seen in the past. So when you think about an Eastern Middle School, you know, we have the ability to, to get more state aid than what we've ever received before. Uh, we have the ability to possibly get 60% match on a project such as uh, Eastern Middle School. So, uh, you know, we feel as the CO CIP progresses um, and when we come back, even in next year's amendment and the next, the following full year, that those schools will, will truly benefit from this bill and, and hopefully help them keep on, on track with, uh, with the current um, timelines that, that we've mapped out. Thank you. Do you have any estimate as to how much additional state aid this might involve? So I think when you when you uh, start to look at the full portfolio, we are working with OMB to really balance uh, both the um, Built to Learn Act funding with you know what would fall under traditional state aid. Uh, when you look at Built to Learn, you know we're really trying to focus in on projects that wouldn't necessarily benefit as much from the traditional Macintosh type of bill, uh, and that that will fund up to 150 percent you know traditional value. So we we do have a, a great chance to receive 50 percent, uh, but all, all said, you know, when you look at a middle school that's averaging about seventy million dollars to get an additional ten percent of state aid out of that is pretty powerful. So as we continue to map this forward, we'll, we'll be able to give those uh, numbers to council and give you very specifics uh, with with you know, respect to affordability. Great, I, I appreciate the answer. Thanks. As you well know, um, I've been uh, writing letters to multiple superintendents for Eastern Middle School uh, for many years, and uh, probably my predecessors were as well. And, you know, schools like that that serve a high number of students that are impacted by uh, high levels of poverty have been really denied attention and delayed for far too long. And I really hope uh, we and the board and um, and the administration make them, you know, high priorities uh, to be consistent with our commitment to racial uh, racial equity and social justice. Um, I know, as you mentioned, there's been significant cost, uh, construction cost increases um, at this time and, and uh, delays due to the supply chain um, challenges. but. Um, I'm very much committed to working with all my colleagues to try to find additional resources as we unpack the state budget and uh, the county proposed budget as well to get as many of these critical projects on track um, as possible. Um, Dr. McKnight, I, it's, um, I'm, it's great to see you here. It's painful to hear the reading of the list of non-recommended cuts. They're countywide, but so many of them fall heavily on the folks I represent in East County who've been waiting for years. Um, under multiple predecessors of yours for adequate facilities. So um, I really want to be able to work closely with you and my colleagues to uh, to put those back on track. And I, so I very much agree and I'm grateful to the ENC committee and Chairman Rice and all the members um, for the recommendation to move up the completion dates of Burtonsville Elementary uh, Edition and Highland View in particular. Um, if we can find additional resources, those are overdue, very important um, and, uh, and high priorities for me. And I really, um, just finally, I want to mention the importance of HVAC replacement. Um, we talk about this every every year in every CIP, and um, as well as ADA compliance and PLR projects like bathrooms. Um, but we're we're at we hope we'll be at the tail end of a respiratory virus pandemic, and the importance of HVAC has never been more important uh, than now. And I really hope that the whole council. Um, you know, can work with you to prioritize that because so many of our older schools greatly need that and it will benefit so many of our students and staff that are heavily impacted and at risk. Um, so thanks so much for everything you're doing. Um, I look forward to many offline conversations about this as we move forward. Thanks again to the Chairman Rice and the ENC committee for moving those up and we need to get them across the finish line. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Friedson. Thank you, Mr. President. I also wanted to express my condolences uh, to you, Mr. Levchenko, and, and to your family, certainly part of our council family, and so we all uh, express our condolences to you, and it is nice to see you back. Um, thanks to everybody for, for your work. Thank you to, to colleagues uh, on, on the uh, ENC committee and, and for the collaboration. I know it's not easy. Uh, Non-recommended cuts are kind of a foreign concept to most people, understandably. It's, it's 
uh, kind of a bizarre uh, process, uh, but one that we have to undertake and one that I know nobody uh, enjoys. Um, I did uh, ha have a question because, you know, so some of the conversation uh, as uh, presented is about costs and some of it is about uh, production delays, supply chain and, and others. And it's difficult at times to decipher the difference. And sometimes it's a distinction without a difference. The supply chain issues add costs, and that is part of the cost overrun. And some of it is just a timing uh, issue where the cost isn't necessarily different, but the timing uh, for supplies, construction materials, uh, contractors perhaps even, uh, is uh, is part of the challenge. So uh, with, 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 and again, it's not unique uh, to Montgomery County Public Schools or to schools uh, more broadly. I mean, this is a, a global challenge that everybody uh, is uh, is facing, as uh, Chair Rice noted earlier, and it's true of all of our other uh, facilities and buildings that we're managing and, and navigating through. Uh, having said that, uh, I wanted to ask about Woodward High School in, in particular, and, and by extension, Northwood High School, since the two projects are, uh, are, are intrinsically linked. Uh, my understanding is that Woodward High School is trending about 45 days behind schedule. That equates based on uh, projections at like four and a half to, to five million uh, dollars uh, in order to get it, you know, so to speak, back on track. Uh, the two issues there are the production delay and the cost increase. And I'm just uh, uh, curious if you could, you know, decipher the difference uh, for, for us, uh, you know, if, if the four and a half to five million were available, state aid or otherwise, uh, would there still be a delay, or is this an affordability challenge? Thank you for that question, uh, Councilman Friedson. Uh, you actually described it well. It's not either or. It's it's often both, and that. And when I say both, I'm speaking specifically about um, how we have been impacted by uh, labor. So that then throws off the timeline for the project. But as we address the labor issues, it's also uh, the supply and the cost increasing as time is uh, being delayed. <laughs> the two projects are linked, and this is these two projects we've actually had many conversations with council about um, over time. And as we look at the phasing in of our projects, and I'll let Seth talk more specifically about it, we're looking at how when projects are already delayed, for instances related to labor as well as cost, how that then makes sense for us to be more advantageous in the phasing in to possibly save money. Um, so that is a part of our consideration when we think about the delay that we've recommended for that project specifically. So I just wanted to, to put that out there because we're looking at all of it, um, but we're also trying to think about how can we utilize money possibly in phase two in a different way when we have more money available to us at that time if delays are already a factor. Mr. Adams, you want to give even more specific? Yes, and I, and I think one of the, the, you know, the unique aspects of, of school construction is the, is the fact that we, we do have a, a very specific deadline. You know, we have to have projects complete for the start of a school year. And, and whereas, you know, I think some of these other projects where, okay, you could have a month, you could have two months, and, you know, it's, it's uncomfortable, you know, to have those delays. A school project such as this where we have Northwood High School uh, moving in, we can't do that mid-year. We can't disrupt the school year. So, so we, we do look at this in, in terms of, you know, how, how critical the timelines are, how, how ultimately we could, um, you know, bring those projects within timeline, uh, understanding that there is additional cost. But what are the, what are the implications of that? Um, you know, so I think part of our um, non-recommended reduction was really looking at this project uh, from that holistic perspective of both phase one of Woodward, the, the Northwood project, phase two of Woodward, how both of those budgets sort of come together um, and, and how we can possibly maximize, uh, you know, the money that we do have uh, within, you know, possible the schedule. So if we see a one-year delay with a Woodward phase one, uh, it actually allows us to start and, and do a little bit more of phase two in preparation for Northwood students when they arrive. Uh, you know, we've had many, many, many conversations with the Northwood families around, you know, what, what to expect when they come into this holding facility. And under the previous uh, approach, you know, there were going to be some things that were, were shortcomings. You know, a little, we're gonna, we were going to have be tight on parking space. We were going to have 
um, specific field challenges. Mm -hmm. I think with this approach, we really want to look at it in terms of, yes, you can, you can add money, we can pull money from phase two and bring this project on time, but are there positives to possibly delaying it? And again, there's not many positives to delay, but in this case, you know, can you look at it for some aspects of a positive? And, and that could be you know, giving more amenities and, and build, having less construction on site while Northwood is there, uh, maximize the dollars that we would ultimately spend on acceleration as part of the construction of phase two. So, so as Dr. McKnight said, it is sort of a, a, a combination of both, uh, but I think that timeline is really, really critical here. And as, as these projects trend forward, we, we have to keep in mind that these projects absolutely have to be complete, absolutely move in ready for that start of school date. Uh, because there are no weeks or two-week delays that we can work with that has to be done by a, by that specific start of school date. Yeah, I understand that like, you either are or you aren't ready, right, in August when school is about to go back into session. And once you miss that timeline, a year uh, is lost. I, I will express concern that the council in previous years has taken significant action in order to uh, maintain both of those, uh, Woodward and Northwood, given the magnitude of the number of students who are impacted. This isn't just relief of one or two clusters. This is a relief of the entire Down County Consortium of Walter Johnson uh, and, and, and beyond. I mean, they're, they're huge impacts. So I, I maintain that level of concern. I am hopeful that uh, there is some opportunity to, to revisit this and, and, and to address it. I understand that there are uh, challenges and if you can't meet the deadline uh, and there's, you know, there's nothing that can be done, then you can't meet the deadline, there's nothing can be done. But uh, if there is an opportunity for, you know, it to be a four and a half or a five million dollar uh, fix, I, I really do think this is something that, you know, we should revisit if we can. I just wanted to, to note that here. But I do appreciate the, the work of the committee, appreciate your collaboration and appreciate the explanation. But uh, hopefully we can continue to have this conversation and, and try to get to a resolution where we're not delaying for one year so many students and so many families uh, who are going to be impacted by it. Thank you. Thank you. Council Vice President Glass. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, so I just want to pick up where Councilmember Friedson uh, left off in, in, in a manner of speaking. Uh, I, I live, my neighborhood is in the, the Northwood area, uh, and so I appreciate the questions. But I think more broadly, one of the things that we need to start addressing more uh, is the types of schools that we're building, right? We had a conversation with planning earlier today. We talked about the changing demographics. We're talking about the lack of space. And so want to hear from you all how these considerations are being envisioned in the CIP in your long-term planning, recognizing that we can't build our way out of physical school infrastructure, right? Um, so I'm, I'm curious your thoughts at this time. Thank you, Councilman Glass. Uh, I, I, I chuckle because we've been having many discussions saying this is our opportunity to be very innovative and also think about how we're able to expand and plan in the future for programs to exist not in traditional spaces, but spaces that are available across our entire county, um, particularly looking at spaces that are in some of our uh, post uh, MCPS learning institutions and, and, and how all that plays into the plan moving forward. So I'll let uh, Mr. Adams speak more specifically, but it is to move into non-traditional spaces. And I, it may have been maybe a couple years ago, you know, at one point I know we were planning for a great opportunity to partner with other institutions like Kid Museum, you know, to be able to provide that learning space so that it represents exactly what we're talking about. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Adams because it's, it's an exciting topic and, and one that I think speaks to innovation in education and moving away from just those traditional spaces that students and families won't feel like this is an addition to educational space, but the schooling becomes a part of these different infrastructures that do represent learning. Dad. And, and great question. I, I did listen in on the the, uh, the planning staff and what I would say is the, the partnerships, it's, it's all about partnerships. So in terms of, you know, the different opportunities around co-locations, the, the opportunities partnering with uh, Montgomery College, USG, in terms of, you know, what can we build, what can they build that can that we can jointly take advantage of so that we're spending the dollar, but you're getting multiple benefits of it. So I would say, you know, the, the difference moving forward is that every project that we are constructing, 
uh, we're looking at multiple ways to solve multiple problems. So uh, I wish Mr. Dice was still in the audience because you know, we, we have had many, many great conversations around you know, that what can we do from a school system that supports uh, you know different aspects of the county. What is the college doing that can support us from a from a program perspective? And we look at our buildings. You know the the Woodward project, the Northwood project, the Crown project that are in in these in the CIP. Um, you will see different spaces that that both serve our students and the innovative programs that Dr. McKnight is bringing forward, but also will allow for more opportunity for community members to take advantage of them. For, for the college to be able to partner with, with different aspects of our building and vice versa. So I think the, the, the change that we're seeing is again, this greater collaboration that is, that is now starting to develop in, in the form of co-locations and, and multiple agencies working together to solve multiple problems. Yes, yes and yes. And, and, and Dr. McKnight, I, I appreciate the enthusiasm about the need to innovate. If we are having challenges finding physical land and we're having budgetary challenges meeting our needs, we need to innovate. We need to do something differently. And I uh, hope to return to the council in the years ahead so that we can continue this conversation uh, because otherwise we will be repeating this conversation, uh, which is not one I think uh, the community wants, nor do we want. Um, we are doing, I, I appreciate the way the, the ENC chair phrased it, we're doing what we can with what we got. That was inartfully quoting him. Um, he did it much better in the original, but we got to innovate. And uh, I look forward to those conversations in the future. So thank you. Councilor Mike Glass, I did, did want to say, uh, when we come back in the future, we'll actually be talking about how this programming is impacting students in a different way that we haven't seen in Montgomery County. It is, the conversations have already started to happen. And as Mr. Adams said, some of it is about how do we build in other spaces, but some of it's about how do we take advantage of the space that's already there that we just now envision as educational spaces. And our partners in the county have been very open to this. I just have to say, this is a great part in terms of being a, a membership in the Montgomery County community because everyone's open and it's not that we've received much resistance. So I just wanted to tell you that this is, this is not a, a wish list, this is a to-do. That's good. <laughs> and, and I recognize the time we could be here a lot longer talking about it, but thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Jawando, followed by Councilmember Reamer. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, Keith, as well, to you and your family. Condolences. Thanks for being here. Uh, Dr. McKnight, good to see you in person. Uh, so that's your chair now. I said that to I said that earlier to uh, Dr. Williams. Once you pick one, you got to come back to it. So no, I'm just kidding. Good to see you, uh, Vice President uh, Silvestri, and all your staff. Um, a lot's been said, and you know, Councilman Bryce, Councilman Navarro will know. I, you know, we. This is tough. You know, it's one of my. It is my favorite committee, but this is my least favorite part of the discussion when we have to take up. Uh, non-recommended cuts um, and you know I have consistently said that you know I think we need to make sure we have the facilities in the right shape with to meet the needs of our students uh, and I know that's what we all feel um, and uh, I'm glad uh, Councilmember Glass just took the approach he did about being innovative and in what those things facilities look like where they are, how they're structured, what they're built with. We're having that conversation. We must have that conversation in anything we build. But we also need to make sure that the we set realistic expectations and the funding streams are available. Um, and, you know, that's something that uh, in the state has not done enough. We always want to get the state to do more, and we're working on that, and we'll see what the McIntosh bill gives us. Um, but, you know, as we move forward, in, this is not to say we're not going to do what we can right now to particularly with the elementary schools, which are, you know, a huge priority uh, uh, for all of us and a very big priority for me. The, the PLAR and the maintenance, huge priority. Um, but going forward, we are going to have to make sure all the other decisions of what our, what the affordability guidelines are, what uh, revenues we generate at the county uh, are lined up with the needs that we have and considering we are in a place right now and I appreciate you saying you're going to come back and talk to us you know continue to talk to us about the impact it's going to have on how you're going to take advantage of this moment 
realizing we're in a moment we've never been in in education or any other field, but particularly in education with what our students are dealing with and their families, to meet the need. Um, you know, we had a uh, we have a lot of things we want to do. We had a great conversation earlier and move forward. Councilmember Navarro's proposal that all of us supported around wellness centers, that's going to require space over time and in different approaches. Um, or we talked about early childhood education. So I commit to you, and uh, as I also hope to come back that and, and be on the education committee uh, with some other folks to make sure that we have the funding streams available to do what we need to do and I and and look at next year even uh, you know mid-year adjustments and I'll say that for myself you know and uh, I just think we're gonna do what we can now we have to have the resources to for our students to make sure that these projects can move forward um, and so I just want to say that as a commitment you're welcome to respond um, but uh, we're going to do what we can through this process, um, but just realize that this is not easy for any of us, and uh, we're going to see what we can do once we crunch all the numbers, and I'm gonna, we're going to keep pushing SE and keep to help us crunch and, as much as possible. So uh, I appreciate it, and, and, th and thank you all for all your work. Back to you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Reamer. Thank you. Uh, it's good to see everyone here. Welcome. Thank you. Um, wanted to just briefly comment on, uh, and Councilmember Rice pinged me on this, um, the comments about co-location and innovative approaches. Uh, you'll remember we were working on a very interesting idea about the Caldor building in downtown Silver Spring, about having that as a MCPS high school and a Montgomery College facility. Um, you know, long story short, the county didn't acquire that building uh, and should have. Um, someone else acquired it, but they are interested in working with us all the same. And um, I think there is an opportunity in the future uh, yet to have a Montgomery College and an MCPS facility there in downtown Silver Spring. Um, and uh, you know, in the coming months, hopefully we'll get clearer about that and be able to share that. Uh, it's not something for next school year, obviously, but uh, you know, in the, in the midterm. Um, but I, I really applaud that kind of thinking, uh, you know, to the extent that we can take advantage of these opportunities we need to. Uh, very briefly on a topic related to air quality, uh, which is sensors. I know that there is a pilot in your budget. I know this is an operating budget item. Uh, there is a pilot in your budget for sensors for air quality in classrooms at Poolsville High School. Um, I think it would be wise for us to just make that a countywide pilot. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we'll, we'll take that up in due course with the operating budget. Um, but, you know, it, it, to me it just seems like there's no search situation in which we wouldn't want to have that information. Uh, and so we might as well, you know, roll it out full, full system wide. Um, other school systems are, are doing that and it's not significantly expensive is my understanding. So I just wanted to put a bookmark on that for you and um, we'll return to the conversation as we as we proceed with the uh, operating budget. Um, but uh, thank you for your work, and I join my colleagues in saying we got to get you as much money as we possibly can. And, you know, we, we, your request is an important request. It's core to what we want to do, and we need to meet it if we possibly can. So we'll hopefully be able to move them out in here for you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Navarro. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Levchenko, I also want to add, of course, my condolences to you and your family, and thank you for being here. Um, so uh, I don't have a lot to add because a lot has been said, and we did have a very robust conversation during our Education and Culture Committee. This is always a very uncomfortable uh, time when we have to um, address these issues. Um, of course, as the veteran who is about to leave the council, um, I will say that we have had a lot worse years. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge that. No, however, I, I do think it's going to be so critical to um, follow on the um, conversation that Council Vice President Glass uh, started, um, because I know that there have been, I believe, reports that have been that were commissioned. I know even when I was a member of the Board of Education, we had conversations about this notion of, you know, innovative design and, and ways to co-locate and and what the future look like and how do we align that as well. And so um, I, I think that we're gonna 
we have no choice but to be a lot more intentional in that respect because there's always going to be need, right? And the spending affordability guidelines, as we used to always be reminded, is about affordability and our debt <laughs> service is something that is significant. And so, you know, to, to the extent that I think we start engaging again, um, because times do change, there are factors like supply chain and, and cost escalations, I, it's, it's very true. But it would be interesting to, to perhaps you know, begin to, to take another look at what are those opportunities, what is that design. We've talked about things like libraries really changing the way they serve our communities and how do, how do we leverage to the maximum you know, possible extent uh, these facilities that are more and more in demand, but we have less and less, uh, not only resources, but even space. Uh, so, um, so that's a, you know, a, a long-term and, and larger conversation, but, um, but truly just wanted to thank all of you once again, for, for everything that you have done. And I think, you know, overall, it's not perfect uh, and we'll do whatever we can, but I think that we are definitely making progress in some significant areas. And of course, thank you to my uh, able chair here, Council Member Rice, for, for always leading us through this conversation in the most optimal fashion. Thank you. Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I based on the hour i will be very quick but uh, uh mr levchenko i too want to join the cho chorus and thank you for being here and 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 uh tell you how sorry we are about your your father and um uh you know there's certain things we can't afford not to do and one of the things we can't afford not to do is to take an opportunity when even though our student population has gotten smaller your student population will not remain smaller. And we, for years, have struggled with the various facilities that we've said we needed. Uh, I talk about them, and my mother was, uh, she was 30 years older than I am, and she went to Gaithersburg Elementary when Gaithers, all of Gaithersburg schools was where the Gaithersburg Elementary is now. It wasn't the same building. But when she went there, they, there was buildings called uh, temporaries. There was like a wooden, it, not exactly a shack, but it certainly wasn't, a, it wasn't a, the nicest buildings in the world. But when she went there, the temporaries were there. She was 30 years older than I am. And when I went there, it was only Gaithersburg Elementary, but those same temporaries were there. Those temporaries were there for 30 years. And so what we have gone through in Montgomery County, this is not new. But what is new is that we have the opportunity to get ourselves it's as best we can, I mean, it's nothing, you know, we don't have all the money in the world, but as best we can back on track so that we don't have these types of situations. And I also agree with my colleagues on many, many other topics on this one, but, but I believe that, that HVAC and all of the things that are literally quality of life, quality of life, need to be done as quickly as we can do them. And hopefully, you know, I, I was involved with the, with the Crown, uh, the getting the land for free for Crown High School for some of the history of Montgomery County that we, that we were able to do that. But if it means holding that up for one year, it certainly is worth doing that versus being able to do the HVAC and all of those other systems. So we're all here to support. We're all here going to try to figure out uh, how to, we're going to pester uh, uh, Essie to figure out how we can do this and Keith, uh, how we can do this. But we're going we're gonna to try our best, but we've got to do the things that are literally quality of life first, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And thank you, uh, Council Member Rice, for all of your hard work. Thank you. And your committee. Thank you all. I just had a flashback as we were talking. I was in a meeting once. Uh, Parker Hamilton was sitting to my left and Don Miller was sitting to my right. And it was a contentious meeting talking about the potential movement of the Wheaton Library from its current location to downtown Wheaton. And at the same time, we were trying to find a full a, a location to have a full service community recreation center in the Wheaton region. But we couldn't find one. And we were talking about squeezing as much of a footprint onto the existing Wheaton Rec Center as we could make it. So Don, on the back of a piece of paper, starts making some sketches, and uh, he puts his, some boxes together, and then he passes a note to Parker, and he passes a note to me, and he said, what do you guys think about combining a facility on the current footprint if we eliminated the road in between? And Parker and I looked at each other, and we were like, why didn't we think of that? 
Um, and so I think we need a symposium. I think this can't be organic. I think that we need a time and space uh, that is facilitated where we bring uh, park and planning, where we bring the college, where we bring DGS, where we bring MCPS, and we also bring some of our private development community acknowledging we have just miles of vacant commercial office space right now. And let's get really creative uh, and look at potential options moving forward because this is a very frustrating conversation. While we are in a much better position than we thought we ever would have been, looking at the list of projects that we're not going to be able to get to, each has their own story and a community that understandably is going to be disappointed. So I think there is an opportunity for us to get especially creative moving forward. And uh, we've got an extraordinarily creative team within the central staff. And I think this is a, probably a full council discussion because it crosses over so many different committees. But I'd like to think about that on the heels of the CIP after we get a chance to catch our breath after this summer uh, and maybe try to target something in the fall um, before, before uh, things get crazy again. Um, but thank you all very much. Uh, your testimony was compelling. This work has never been more important. We agree with everything you've said, and we will do what we can uh, to move forward as many projects as we can, given the challenges before us. So colleagues, we have a committee recommendation before us right now. Um, I think that uh, without objection, we will, in a straw vote, support that at the moment, and we'll see what we can do as we reconcile the CIP in the end. But that's as best we can do for at the moment. So, but thank you all very much. Thank you. And with that, colleagues, I believe we are adjourned. I think we should just keep going. No, we don't get we don't get paid over.